How you doing, brother? Good. Praise the Lord Jesus. God bless you, bro. Amen, brother. You're looking great. Uh, I hope I do. I'll eventually look like you one day. Oh, brother Noah, you look better. You look great. You still hitting the gym, brother? Well, I'm I'm going to try to get there tonight. We'll see. If not, I'll just do my cardio because uh, hectic on Thursday because after this, I got a session. Oh, yeah. No, I know what you mean. Uh, man, I've had stuff all day long as well. We did uh, did that show with uh, David uh, David Hart earlier, the, the guy that believes that every single human being on earth will be saved. Oh, universalism? Oh, yeah. Uh, I got but, listen. I mean, you know, those interviews, uh, you know, we're just interviewing them on their book. Uh, you know, we can't... Uh, we're cute, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're just interviewing them in the book. But I did reach out to him, and I did tell him um, uh, I'd like to debate him on the issue, because uh, in his book, apparently... Uh, he makes the argument that no, nobody in the early church taught eternal hell. Are you kidding me? Hey, that's what he taught and said. Hey, come on. Yeah. Uh, give me like a everyone wants to quote mine the fathers. I know. I mean, that, that, that's the problem. And if you do that, you end up uh, believing Unitarianism or any other kind of heresy. Ain't, ain't that right, Thomas? Who's Thomas? Hey, what's up, William? Thomas is, is he's very bright, brother. He watches your streams as well sometimes. Rarely puts his camera on. Uh, real young guy, uh, but he's really, really bright. Poor guy. Poor Thomas. Why would you watch me, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had better taste than that. No, yeah, Thomas, we hadn't seen you here in a while. How have you been, brother? I've been all right. I've been all right. Um, I've just been, you know, working and doing school stuff and uh, working on side stuff. You know but what he's trying to do, Sam? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what Thomas has been doing. Thursday nights, he's been going to a Protestant youth gathering. He's trying to pick up girls to date. What's whoa, up? whoa, whoa, whoa. Thomas. I never said that. Thomas, what's up, man? That's not the way to get married, bro. Well, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Why do you look familiar? I've seen you before. He's been, he's been here before, you brother. Probably have seen me. I see. You probably have seen me. Yeah, yeah, you look, you look, I've seen you so much. Uh, there was one time I actually got into like a bit of an argument with you over oh. the dude campaign, and I loved that. I, you're probably my favorite person I've gotten into a YouTube argument with. I don't remember. Why did I do that? Though? When was this? No, it, it was just a mutual thing. It was like, it was months ago. I was what? like, oh, wait, that's, that's Mr. Shamoon's channel. And then, what um, I, one thing about comments on my uh, comment section, I, I, on someone else's like channel, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the reason why I don't like comments on comment section, like with me, is because a person can write 50,000 words without addressing the issue. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. So I don't like that because I used to do that in the beginning days. There was a Muslim who would send me 50 emails with 50,000 yeah. words. I know it's hyperbole, but, and then I'd respond like an idiot. And then I realized, you know what? What am I being stupid for? Why am I sitting there? It becomes an ego fest. So what I do is I tell people, Skype me. Because then mm. we can talk where you go off on a tangent, I can stop you. No, 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 no. Stop. In fact, uh, yeah. yesterday, you guys got to watch last night's session. A good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine from Chicago, he's a Protestant pa pastor. His name is Joe Wyrostek. Young man, Italian, hot-blooded. Uh, you'll see me teaming up with him, debating black Hebrew Israelites. We have two debates with them in their church. Wow, so, and you had that, you had that um, the other day. Really? Yeah, so he, uh, him and I in Chicago, in person in their church, but he found out I embraced communion of saints, and he cut off ties with me and wrote a book trying to refute me. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah seriously. Okay, because uh, he knows, because uh, my channel, it's, it's, and it's, you know, people know about it, so he got worried that maybe some of his church members would start believing. So he called last night, and to be honest with you, glory to Jesus Christ. The sessions I did on Communion Saints rocked him enough where he admit, you'll hear him admitting, yeah, I believe the saints are alive. Wow. They are perfected. They are praying for us. They are interceding for us. And they're aware of things on earth. Wow. He did all that. So I go, okay. So I go, all right, then what's the problem? He goes, oh, but there's nothing in the Bible says I can then ask them to pray. I said, that's the only argument, really? I go, so you admit all this. They're, they're aware of our plight on earth. Yes. They do pray for us on earth, yes. They do intercede for us on earth, yes. And they are perfected, so their prayers are, are absolutely perfect because there's no sin. Yes, I go, and you just made a case for communion of saints. And if, I go, stubborn. If, you want, if I go, you want an explicit reference, you know where I'm going with this. Oh, I go, yeah. And he brought it too. He said, yeah, I know the argument you use, the Holy Spirit, he is God. We love him. We worship and pray to him. Even though the Bible doesn't say worship or pray to the Holy Spirit. Like, exactly. Right. That's an inference, right? Yeah. Yep. 
So how do we get this uh, inference? Well, if members of the body of Christ are exhorted to pray for one another, and they're still the members of the body of Christ, and now they're glorified, and they pray for us, and we can ask one another to pray, why then can I ask them to pray for me? I go, so it doesn't have to be spelled out black and white. And I go, I came accepting this uh, doctrine, kicking and screaming, not wanting to. And so he got, so what's my point? He came and I stopped him at key points and said, no, 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 read the passage. Had he been in the comment section, he would have gotten away with murder. So that's oh, why yeah. I don't like comment section. I get angry. No, in fact, I think, in my opinion, in my brother, opinion. the comments and uh, comm boxes are a waste of time to debate yep. in them. 100%. They are. I will yeah. not debate a person in a comment section. I won't do it, you know. It's rare that I have a fruitful discussion in a comment section. You rarely, yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to... Um, and really, I don't have the time for that. If somebody wants to have a fruitful discussion, you know, we can do it. We can have it in audio or in video. But I forgot to tell you, Sam, uh, guess, who, uh, guess who reached out to me uh, yesterday, last night, oh. with an invitation for me and you to go to, oh. to dialogue with them. But I didn't reply because of what was done to the brother Ariel. Um, no, no, I don't. That's a jazz trick because why? He wants to get back in. Yeah, um, it wasn't him. Oh. But uh, it was uh, some guy, and I knew it right away, a guy that was pretending to be a Trinitarian emailed me, said, hey, I'm a Trinitarian. Uh, funny enough, he claimed to be a huge fan of my work and your work. If that was true, he would have sent me a friend request, that baloney, number one. I went to your friend list. I looked. He wasn't there. So I, right away, I sniffed out he was lying. Then number two, he said, I'd like for you and Sam to come and have a debate and discussion with somebody that that will be announced later along with kenny uh kenny uh Bomer or whatever that guy's name don't is say you don't. no don't announce later give me the name now but those guys uh don't those guys pull tricky stuff yeah well kenny Bomer, uh he's, he's got, a criminal yeah yeah he was he's got a weird history uh because i was going at him and the comment section and turns out unfortunately he went through a similar experience with his ex-wife that i went through Oh, my bad. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. His ex-wife was having an affair and, and she got him in trouble using the legal system. So that's why he became sympathetic to my plight and he didn't want to attack. And I felt bad for him. And I think one of his sons died. His sons, who, one of his sons who, were who killed. Who brainwashed him to go to Islam though? Uh, in the jail. Oh man. In the jail, in the jail system. Oh yeah. That's a big thing in the jail. Yeah. So he's not as, he's not a, the jerk that he may give the impression of being okay my bad then i, no, I didn't know no he's not i talked to him but you know obviously he's zealous for his faith unfortunately right and i pray he gets out of it but man when he told me his horror story i was like wow okay then i'm gonna tell the gentleman i'll reply i'll tell him tell me who the other guy is we'll, you know, uh, tell me because the jazz yeah. even shiver ali said he told the jazz to step down and stay away from debating so he has it. comes in what he wants to do is he wants us to validate him yep to validate him and give him a reason to, to continue doing his garbage. Yeah, say no, yep. you get, get lost. Get anyone else but him, we'll do it. Agreed. And we don't need to dialogue with him anymore. We, we, uh, we took care of that a while back. No, he's slime. What he did to Ariel, slime. Oh, they're, man. And he's they're, been they're... doing he doxing people for years. Even Paul Williams exposed him on his blog. Paul Williams was a Muslim who is supposedly agnostic, but, you know, uh, he still leans towards Islam, so he can't stand this, these guys. He exposes every one of them. They hate him. i tell you one thing. I saw that uh, – I read that article you linked to, and wow, claiming that he has um, a list of uh, people that he hates. He knows where they live. He knows their addresses and everything. He does, yeah. he's, what he's a crazy slime. guy. Slime. Yeah, sorry, guys, that oh, yeah. we're wasting your time on these points, so forgive Don't us. Don't worry. We're, we're going to start, everybody. Um, Brother, I'm trying to remember where we stayed off. I remember we were talking about Zechariah, Jeremiah. We were trying to finish Jeremiah 20. That's right. But we went into issues because issues arose about David. Does anyone remember where we ended? Because I think what happens is some people get confused, and then we need to clarify and explain and expound. And because William and I do a lot of sessions daily, I can't keep up where I left off in what session because we're doing a lot of stuff every day. He does stuff. I do stuff daily. So I don't remember where we left off last week. Was it on Jeremiah or did we, does anyone remember those of you taking notes? Yeah. 
We started uh, Jeremiah 23 5. That's we started, but where did we end, sister? See, you're killing me right now. <laughs> no, I, that's no, where we ended. We started okay. it and we ended there. Oh, yeah. Those oh, are okay. my last notes. Sorry about that. And I'm giving you, and I'm giving you a hard time. Don't worry, Samantha. <laughs> Thank you for having notes, Samantha. We appreciate poor, poor it. Girl. She's like, dude, this guy, this Assyrian. <laughs> Remember, we got that blood between us, Samantha, Assyria and Israel. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I have to take notes. I, I, I'm an avid note taker. Praise God. That makes yeah. it second nature, and then you can use it. Exactly. Yeah. And I learned, somebody told me uh, this a long time ago when I was in school. You remember over 60% of what you write, less than 40% of what you read. 100%. Or listen to. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely true. I know that because when I write, it becomes second nature. Yeah. Got so, yeah. I know Jeremiah 23. I don't know if we went to Ezekiel because I explained... No. Jerusalem no. called. Oh, we didn't go to Ezekiel? No. Which no. Being called? You didn't. Now I remember you saying Jerusalem. you were going to go to Ezekiel. So wait, hold on. We didn't talk about Jerusalem being called Yahweh our righteousness? We never got to that? We did. Actually, you know what? We did talk about that briefly. We did. Right. You know how I remember? I remember because, yeah, because I went over the fathers that confirmed that. Oh, yes, right. Okay. You know what? I think it came to me. Maybe we'll begin a prayer and I'll just give a recap. We'll move on. And then segue into the New Testament, because I'm trying to show the Old Testament basis yep. for Messiah being God in the flesh. And then we'll segue into the New Testament. New Testament is a lot of meat, so we're preparing for that. But if someone wants to pray and bless us, and then I'll recap, because I think I remembered. I think I did. Ariel, brother, would you, would you like to pray? If you, you usually pray. You give great prayers. It's all by the grace of God. Uh, I'll Amen, try. <laughs> by God's grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord. Son of the Father, only begotten Son, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your grace. We know that everything we have that is good only comes from you um, so that we may not boast. And we ask for your blessings. We ask that you may give us wisdom, discernment, prudence, uh, the insight that you would have us to, to use to understand your scriptures we ask that you, you may reveal to us more about the revelation within both the New and the Old Testament concerning your divinity, your, your humanity, the divinity of your companion, the Holy Spirit, and obviously your unity along with the Holy Spirit with your uh, Heavenly Father, the Lord. We ask that we, we may be able to use these evidences to refute those who deny the divinity of the only true God, yes, God and deny your divinity Lord and we ask that we may be able to accurately and clearly show those who do not know the scriptures as well how to, how to interpret the words of the new and the old testament and be able to demonstrate those 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 truths in scripture lord and we ask that as as we go through this session we may be able to listen to your servants uh william sam and be able to, to listen to the questions of, of the other people here in this room and be able to consider the questions consider the answers um not to add our own interpretation interpretation into these passages but to only gather what scripture itself says not to read into the text but to read out of the text what's already in the text and uh, that we may glorify you lord because all we do here is to your glory we seek not our own glory um, we seek not our own um, honor before men but only the honor that comes from you lord and we ask you to purify our hearts that as we do this we are not doing so um as we, uh, you know, being hypocrites, but we do so um, being, having integrity, having an honest heart, not seeking to deceive others and seeking to be authentic and honest, both to you and to, and to others. And even after the session, we ask that you may continue to purify us because 
I know that I need purification. I need help yes, for my for my sins, for my temptations, Jesus. from the harm I've, I've done others and the harm I've done to myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure many everybody else in here definitely needs purification yeah, and sanctification. And uh, we need you, Lord, every day, every second. Yes. And uh, Lord, please help us. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that prayer is like you, you're reading my heart, man. May oh, God man. Jesus I was um, making a point, and I was telling, um, in fact, I was talking to, to Thomas about it last night, how um, certain prayers, one prayer that, uh, that, uh, that I recall um, that was made into a song, Hark the Herald Angels, was written by uh, one of the Wesleyan brothers, uh, Methodist. But if, if, you, if you know the lyrics, they're so Christological, so focused in the deity of Christ that if they don't move your heart and, you know, almost bring you to tears, I don't know what could, man. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 they're incredible. Lord have mercy on us to finish the journey with integrity and glorify him in Jesus' name. It's hard. It's a battle. It sucks. It sucks being fallen, tainted, but. True, brother. It is what it is. Just Amen. to recap, because I do remember, what happened was, the reason why I couldn't remember is because we went into a huge discussion on heavenly Jerusalem. I remember. Yep. That, that really got a lot of people like perplexed and puzzled. Yep. And, it took about a little, an hour or more that alone. Oh, good. I was asked a question. Ironically, someone asked me, what do I think about baptismal regeneration? I know I'm going to shock a lot of you guys. I've come to accept all these things now. Uh, water baptismal regeneration, uh, deuterocanonicals. I, I accept it. I can't yep. fight it anymore. You know, and uh, I know a lot of people are being troubled by my journey, but I'm just being as true as I can to the Holy Spirit guiding me, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and for the glory of Christ. And I know I'm going to lose people. I'm going to have people disliking what, this journey, just like they dislike me when I believe differently, right? I mean, that's the whole thing. You're going to have people who are going to be praising God for your journey and people calling you an, a heretic yep. and an ecumenist, right? You know. But I was, uh, I was friends with Sam before you began going down this road, brother. So... Yeah, if, 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 if I didn't stop being your friend back then, these other people shouldn't stop being your friend now. Yeah. Well, no, not a lot of people think that if I am pro-Catholic, I am part of the one world system. Because you still have people out there, you guys know this, that they think that the Antichrist system is coming out of Roman Catholicism. Rome oh, is yeah. Antichrist. This was the belief of the Protestant reformers. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, yeah. If anything, it's coming out of Protestantism. Say it again, brother? If anything, it's coming out of Protestantism. Uh, yeah. If you look at the Third Temple and the um, like, the idea that that's going to be where the Antichrist comes from, and all of the support for Israel from yeah. United yeah. States evangelicals. Yep. But don't forget, also, brother, you have some in your own camp that are set set of a cantus. Oh yeah. I, Sam, I used to be a set of a cantus. You, used to be one. you understand, right? <laughs> huh? So you, you understand that when you I, have, I, I, the, I used to torture him daily. Thing. Yeah, yeah, he used to. Yeah, so you get it. So when you were there, you would hold the position that the Pope, the Antichrist, would arise from these corrupt popes. So that doesn't help. That actually, uh, I actually held that John Paul II was the Antichrist. See, I tell you, man, you guys are out there, man. Behind every, yeah. every oh, every I would have fun. With there's a Sam. Jesuit. In fact, the Illuminati even got us by pizza. There's mm-hmm. Illuminati pizza. That's a code word for Illuminati. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, got, kidding with you guys, man. Anyway. Yeah, oh, look at that. Abel, every time Abel's here, he always wants that laugh, brother. Every yeah. time he's here. Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got issues. Now, coming back to issue nine, I don't want to bore you guys. We got different brothers and sisters from different backgrounds. We have some who are Protestant here, Orthodox. So I don't want to alienate anyone because my conviction is no matter where I land, if you're a diehard Trinitarian, you worship the Triune God, and believe the Bible is God's perfect word, I can hold hands with you, even though you may condemn me as a heretic. Because I want to be debating Matt Slick. Side note. Wow. Matt Slick, at the end of October, Unlimited Atonement. Who? Oh, I'm done wow. with that nice. debate, I promise you. I promise you when the debate is done, he's going to call me a heretic. I oh, yeah. So I, want to be a I would say be very careful, though, because I debated him um, months or maybe even a year ago and uh, on baptismal regeneration. Um, and the sort of tactics that he uses are a bit slimy. Oh, but Sam knows. Are you that other debate? Because I just watched the debate here with a guy named A.K. Robertson, and I'll be honest, though A.K. Robertson, Church of Christ, schooled Matt Slick. He did. Yep. 
Yeah. Were yeah. you the other one? Because I saw another debate on baptism. Was that you? Uh, mine was titled, um, I was titled as Thomas Enos. That's my name on a, on, um, a Discord account that I was using. It didn't get very many views because it was just posted on a channel that was kind of small. But yeah. Well, pray for me because I don't want to be mean to him, mean-spirited. But one thing about Matt, just guys, sorry, I'm going on a tangent. Although you may not like, him, not like him and he may be aggressive, still pray for him because he's got Asperger's and he's got constant ringing in his ears where he gets discombobulated. He can't hear too well. That's why he gets agitated and angry. His wife is very ill and he had yeah. to bury a son. He mm -hmm. one of his sons died, buried them, and his daughter has become an atheist and has spoken out against his faith. Yeah, yeah, it's very sad with the daughter. I didn't know about some of that other stuff, but yeah, yeah yes, definitely... the man. I know he can be harsh and he can be very anti-Catholic in his rhetoric. Calvinist are I used to be, but you know what? I, I even if he condemns me, he's still my brother. But with that said, guys, let's recap because you're not here for me to be. I, know, I, I will say one thing, brother, and I know you're going to confirm this. And everybody here, because uh, I know we have people that are Orthodox, uh, Evangelical, and Catholic. The one thing about Matt Slick, and you're going to be shocked, Thomas, that I love, is that Matt does want to get down and dirty when dealing with the biblical details. Everybody here should want to do that. Um, and Sam knows why I'm saying that. I heard a debate you did a couple of days ago uh, with somebody that didn't want to talk about the Bible. If you are part of an apostolic church, Catholics, evangelicals, or, or Orthodox, and you don't want to talk about the Bible, uh, reconsider what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I don't consider him an enemy. He's my brother, but he's going yeah. to consider me one. That's okay. I don't care if he calls me heretic. Just hopefully the, the debate won't be, because he gets loud and animated and can talk down to you. And I'm afraid, because I can do, be dirty too. So I got to really constrain myself. Pray for me. For record it. You got to record it, brother. No, it's going to be recorded. It's on Gospel Truth. But what it is, is because when someone eggs me on, I react to it. And I don't want to do that because it's going to be a very bad debate. It's like Donald Trump and Joe Biden. <laughs> Dude, that debate. Wow. Woo! I don't want because that's what's going to happen with me and Matt because we both get angry. So God constrained for the glory of Jesus. Donald Trump and Chris Wallace, right? All right. It was two against one. Two yeah, against yeah. one, guys. Like punk Chris Wallace. But anyway, guys. Uh, let, let me just recap so you understand where we're going with this, because last week we went into Heavenly Jerusalem because some people were like really perplexed, confused about Heavenly Jerusalem being the bride of Christ. I hope you got some clarity. If you're still confused, I'm here to serve you. My brother, William Albrecht, we're brothers in arms. I'm here Amen. to be a blessing to him and his group. And if you're his group, you're my group in, in Jesus' name. So if you still have some confusion, you can ask me. But the reason why that happened, let me show you the, the method to my madness. We had gone to Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Let me recap. Let me tell you why, how it ended up there. Yeah, I do, Roger. I ask for intercession daily to help me. Um, I'm a sick puppy. I'm damaged. So God will heal me. Jesus, Rafa. Okay, here's how this started. We went to Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. This is a prophecy of the king. The days are coming, surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. So notice, it's not David God is raising up, but a branch from David who is righteous. A branch from David who is righteous, meaning a physical descendant from David's family tree. Why is he called a branch? Because this is David's family tree. So from this family tree comes a branch, a physical descendant. <clears throat> he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, in his days, <clears throat> I lost my place. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. He, this physical branch descendant, will be called the Lord is our righteousness. That's the divine name. yod Hey vav Hey, yod Hey wav Hey. however you want to pronounce it. Yahweh, Yehovah, Yahweh, I don't care. I, I, I tend to pronounce it Jehovah because that's the popular anglicized way of saying it. The King James made it popular. Jehovah, our righteousness. So notice his name is Jehovah, our righteousness. So he's human, a human son of David, but he is called Jehovah, our righteousness. Now go to Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16. So you see why we ended up with Jerusalem, why we ended up talking about Jerusalem, right? Uh, because here, Jerusalem is called Jehovah, our righteousness. Okay, now notice. 
Same prophecy, but reiterated elsewhere in Jeremiah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. See, it's the same prophecy, but now notice there's a difference here. There's one thing that's different. And this is the name by which it will be called. Now, in this translation, it did two things. It inserted the, the words, the name, and it translated the pronoun as it. Literally, the Hebrew says, and this is what she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That's a literal translation. And this is what she will be called. The Lord our righteousness or Jehovah's righteousness. But even here with the pronoun it, it's telling you it's not referring to the branch. It's referring to Jerusalem, the city. So the point was, why is Jerusalem called the Lord is our righteousness? And that's why we went to Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel 48, 35. Let me tie in the threads, repeat this point so it sinks in, so we can go to some other prophecies. In Ezekiel 48, 35. Ezekiel 48, 35. Okay. The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits. And the name of the city from that time on shall be the Lord is there. Jehovah is there. So this is talking about the restored Jerusalem. And what will restore Jerusalem be called? Yahweh, Yahovah, Shama. The Lord is there. So notice there's two names now for Jerusalem. Jerusalem's called the Lord is there. Jehovah is there. And it's called Jehovah is our righteousness. But it's given a third name. A third name. Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17. Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17. I will, Jeremiah 3, 16, 17, I'm sorry, I was reading 15. And you will, when we, uh, and when you have multiplied and increased in the land, and those this says, in those days say, says the Lord, Lord, loosen my tongue, they shall no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They're not going to be looking for the Ark of the Covenant, because remember in the first temple, the Ark of the Covenant was there. You won't remember the Ark, you won't be looking for the Ark, you won't need the Ark anymore. Why? Something better is going to be there. Because the ark is simply a, an icon of a greater reality. So what's going to be there? The ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind. You won't be thinking about it or be remembered or missed. Nor shall another one be made. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. And all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they shall no longer stubbornly, stubbornly follow their own evil will. Do you know why you won't remember the ark? Do you know why you won't make another ark? Because you're going to have something better. The presence of the Lord. The Hebrew presence means his face will be there. God's face will be there. His throne will be there. And God will be on his throne in Jerusalem. That's why it's called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord is there. Because the prophets envision, as the Holy Spirit revealed to them, God himself is coming. Not another. God is coming. God will come to live in Jerusalem, and God will come to sit and throne in Jerusalem. So now notice why it's called the Lord our righteousness, the Lord is there, the throne of the Lord. It's being named after the king who dwells in the city, because it's the city of the king. Whose city is it? The king's city. Who's going to be living in it? The king. But who's the king? The Lord God Almighty. I want that to sink in before I move in. The prophets are envisioning a time where God himself will be living on earth in Jerusalem and will be seen in Jerusalem. And the nations will come to see him in Jerusalem. This is confirmed in Zechariah 14. Everyone with me so far? Do I move on? <clears throat> Sorry about that. So far, you guys with me? When, I, when there's silence, that's either because you guys are really thinking deeply or you're stunned or I'm putting you to sleep, curing your insomnia. Which is it? Okay, hopefully it's not. I'm not curing your insomnia. Okay, so let's go to Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 17. Watch here. Okay. Then all who survive of the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king. So they're going to go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the festival of booths. Now pay attention, 17. 
if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain upon them. So here Zechariah says, a day is coming, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, will be in Jerusalem reigning as king. And the survivors of the nations must send representatives to visit him there and honor him there and worship him there because he's going to be there in Jerusalem. But now here's the key, key text, verse 9, Zechariah 14, verse 9. Same chapter, verse 9. How many kings will be reigning from Jerusalem? Guys, fo focus on this. How many kings will be reigning in Jerusalem? And the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So how many kings? Only one. How many lords are there? Only one. So who's going to be the sole king over all the earth? The Lord. And where will he begin ruling over the earth? Jerusalem. So far, so good? Do I move on? Okay, so everyone got it, right? The Lord God, not a creature. The Lord God is coming to dwell in Jerusalem. His throne will be in Jerusalem. He will be dwelling there visibly. The nations will have to come see him visibly. His face there in Jerusalem as he sits in throne. His throne is there and reigns over the earth as king. This too is confirmed in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 43, verses 1 to 9. So let's tie in the threads, because now we got a dilemma. Ezekiel 43, verses 1 to 9. Then he, then he brought me to the gate, the gate facing east. And there the glory of the God of Israel is coming from the east. The sound was like the sound of mighty, mighty waters, and the earth shone with his glory. The vision I saw was like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and like the vision that I had seen by the river Chabar. That's in Iraq. Babylon, modern-day Iraq. It's still there. Yep. And I fell upon my face. As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Notice the role of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's empowering Ezekiel and enabling Ezekiel to see this vision and see God. So notice the role of the Holy Spirit, even though the New Revised Standard Version did not capitalize the S because it's a liberal translation. It doesn't there want is. to sound too Trinitarian. Okay? So I want you to keep catch that. Now let's read that from 6. While the man was standing beside me, I heard someone speaking to me out of the temple. He said to me, mortal, even here, the literal Hebrew is, ben Adam, son of man. So the New Revised Standard Version, just side note, New Revised Standard Version likes to paraphrase and it's gender inclusive. So instead of saying son of man, because of its gender inclusive philosophy, it says mortal. I'm looking at uh, William's face. He doesn't look too happy. Oh, <laughs> uh, brother, I, I, people always tell me it looks like I got a mean face on. I'm, I'm not mean at all. I'm just... No, I'm saying mean because I thought you were upset at the translation and it's a uh, very liberal slant. Oh, I was earlier. I, I, I mean, I'm just embarrassed that it has the name uh, Catholic uh, smacked onto it. Yeah. Well, I mean, what a shame. Mortal, yeah. Instead of saying, and I'll show you an example how this gender inclusive language in some places, it's helpful to show you that it's not just males that God has in mind. But in other places, it really robs the text of its, of its power and beauty. But anyway, mortal, literally it's son of man, Ben Adam. But let's go with it. Mortal, this is the place of my throne. This is God speaking. What place? Jerusalem, where the temple is situated, is the place of my throne. And the place for the soles of my feet where I will reside among the people of Israel forever. Are you seeing the glorious promise of the Hebrew Bible? The glorious promise of the Hebrew Bible to Israel is, I, the Lord God Almighty, will come. I am coming. I will live in your midst. I will place my throne in Jerusalem, and I will sit on my throne in Jerusalem where you will see me, and the nations will come to see me. That's the glorious promise of the Hebrew Bible. But now let's continue where I will reside among the people of Israel forever. The house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they, they nor their kings, by their whoring and by the corpses of their kings at their death, 
when they place their threshold by my threshold and their doorposts by my, beside my doorposts, meaning the temple, with only a wall between me and them, they were defiling my holy name by their abominations that they committed. Therefore, I've consumed them in my anger. They won't do that anymore. They won't sit against me where I won't have to consume them anymore. Now let them put away their idolatry and the corpses of their kings far from me, and I will reside among them forever. So you see Ezekiel 43 and 48, Zechariah 14, Jeremiah 3, 16, 17. All of these prophets said, Jerusalem is the city the Lord God Almighty will come visibly to live in, dwell in. He's going to take up his throne in Jerusalem. He's going to reign over the earth as the sole king over the, the entire earth in Jerusalem. And the nations will come because they know God is there to behold his face in Jerusalem. So you guys now see why Jerusalem's called the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is there in the throne of the Lord. Because the city is being named after her king. The city belongs to the king and it's named after the king that lives there. So who's the king that lives in Jerusalem? The Lord God Almighty. Everyone got it? Just want to make sure you get it. But hold on. Let's go back to Jeremiah 23 verse 5. Now here's where the Jews who don't believe in Jesus or the Trinity will get stumped. Yep. I'm not lying to you. They'll get stumped if you know this. Don't even quote the New Testament. Just use the Hebrew Bible. Don't quote the New Testament. Say, hey, I'm just going to go to your Hebrew Bible. I'm just going to quote your Hebrew Bible. I'm not going to quote New Testament, and I want you to explain these for me. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. So you ask them the question, who is coming to reign in Jerusalem to save Judah? This righteous branch of David. What does it mean that he's the righteous branch? It means he's a physical descendant of David. So now I'm really confused. Now I want you to assume you're an unbelieving Jew. Samantha is a believing Jewish sister. She's a Jewish woman who's completed because she worships the Messiah. But I want her to assume she's not a Jew who believes Catholic in Jesus. now. Just I'm sorry. FYI. Yeah, right. Catholic, religiously, ethnically, you're still Jewish. Yeah. Sure. All right? Don't confuse yeah. ethnicity with religion. See, I'm a Syrian, and I'm yeah. a gorgeous Assyrian, but I'm, you know, you get it? So you can be Catholic, but ethnically, you're Jewish. Baruch yeah. Hashem! No, but anyway, <laughs> what's the point? The Jews who don't believe in Jesus who embrace the fullness of the truth and don't believe in the Trinity. You ask them, say, hey, so this righteous branch, he's a human being, right? Yeah. And he's a physical son of David, right? Yeah. Now, can you reconcile this with what I just read in Zechariah 14, where it says, the Lord God is coming, and he will be king over all the earth, and he is the one who's coming to rule in Jerusalem. How is it that the Lord God will be the only king over the, uh, over the earth, and he's the one coming to reign in Jerusalem, if God is going to send a righteous branch from David to reign. How can you have a human being reigning from the line of David if God is coming to reign in Jerusalem, God's throne will be there, and he'll be the only king over all the earth? How do you reconcile that contradiction? There is no contradiction, because verse 6 tells you the branch of David is the God of Israel becoming flesh. There's your key. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he'll be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Bam, there you go. David's descendant is none other than the God of Israel becoming flesh, becoming a human descendant of David. That's why he's called the Lord is our righteousness. And another thing to, to recall, I think, um, I don't know how many people were here last week. Uh, but by the way, brother, I got to get you that PDF I compiled what I did show them last week uh, on this very passage in Jeremiah 23 uh, I, uh, and the overwhelming exegesis in the early church, I was able to combine church fathers from the 100s, 200s, 300s, 400s, and I think I stopped there, where they interpreted this in a unanimous fashion in the exact way that you've just laid it out. And if you guys saved the link I gave you last week on my blog, yep. I quoted rabbinic Jewish sources that say the branch is Messiah, Mashiach, and that the one riding on a donkey is Mashiach, and the one coming on the clouds of heaven is Mashiach, Messiah. So you got all this information from all quarters and even unbelieving rabbinic Jews. So the yep. question is, 
if you're Jewish, what are you going to do with this? How can the Lord God come and his throne be in Jerusalem and he starts reigning in Jerusalem and the nations will come to see his face in Jerusalem and he's the only king over all the earth, which is why Jerusalem is named the Lord is there, the throne of the Lord, the Lord our righteousness, because it's being named after the king who lives there, whose city it belongs. With the fact that God is going to raise up a human branch of David to rule in Jerusalem. How do you reconcile that? See, we Christians have the answer. Messiah is the son of David, and he's the son of God, and therefore the God of Israel in the flesh. But if you're not a Trinitarian, and you don't believe Jesus Messiah, and you don't believe the New Testament, reconcile these passages for me. I didn't even go to the New Testament. I'm just going Old Testament here. And I think that is one point um, that is really important, Sam. Wouldn't you agree if you are able to show this kind of a teaching in the Old Testament, then supplement that with a teaching in the New Testament? I mean, it's irrefutable when you present this to Muslims or to anybody that's a, that is a non-Trinitarian. It's destruction not only of rabbinic Judaism, Islam, because Muslims say the Old Testament agrees with the Quran and their conception of God. Yep. All right. So, guys, you see, for you guys who are Trinitarian, you're like worshiping, like, wow. Even the Hebrew Bible prophesied the coming king is God in the flesh. Hallelujah. So, Jesus wasn't an imposter who's contradicting the Old Testament. He truly did fulfill the Old Testament in that he is the God who becomes the human branch of David, which is what the Old Testament, if you read it correctly. And by the way, that's a method of rabbinic interpretation. What the rabbis like to do is, they like to link phrases or concepts found in different books together to get a complete picture. So one of the rabbinic methods of interpreting the Old Testament, which is a Christian method as well, is when we find passages that speak a, to the same theme or address a similar, if not same concept, or uses the same words, we then try to combine all those passages together to get a coherent whole, a picture. And the rabbis were doing that before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and even now. They'll look to different books and see if they use the same words or are touching upon the same theme or are referring to a same concept. And then they bring all those passages together to see what those passages together say about a particular subject. And the New Testament writers do that. Can I give you an example of that? You guys mm -hmm. want an example of the New Testament writers combining two different prophets because the prophets are speaking about the same theme. Mark 1, verses 1, 1 to 3. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Notice here. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. That's Malachi 3, 1. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3. Mark combines... Malachi 3.1, the prophecy of Malachi, with Isaiah 40, verse 3, the prophecy of Isaiah, together. Why? Because both prophets are referring to the same theme, an envoy, an emissary, a messenger sent to prepare for the coming of God. See, I am sending my messenger prayer the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, Isaiah 40, verse 3. So that's what Mark did. Why did Mark take two different prophets, combine them together? Because though they are different prophets, they're talking about the same event, same advent, the same theme. Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for our God. Now, side note. Why Bible versions are important, and you have to know which ones are more accurate. Now, let me repeat. All of your major English translations translate the same text over 90% of the time, meaning because the Greek manuscripts have such a high degree of agreement, the Greek copies of the New Testament and the versions, any translation you read will agree over 90% of the time. That's the amazing accuracy of our extent manuscript tradition. But obviously, when things are hand copied, scribes do make mistakes and change things. And no two scribes will make the same mistakes or change the manuscript the same way. So there are variant readings. 
So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, this is not a statement of faith. This is a statement of fact. Yep. Even a skeptic as Bart Ehrman would tell you, when it comes to the manuscript evidence in support of the accurate transmission of the New Testament, the New Testament is in a league all on its own. We have some estimate 5,900 copies in Greek of the different books of the New Testament, and we have nearly 10,000 copies in Latin. We have more Latin copies of the books of the Bible than we do Greek, the language of the New Testament. You guys know that? And you know, another person that would agree with that, brother, um, and, and when, I, when I named this person, anybody here that knows who he is will say, well, that guy's a radical, radical, um, uh, you know, agnostic, Robert Price. Uh, Robert well. Price, even though Robert Price argues against the historical Christ, he still agrees with everything Sam said. Believe it or not, as, as way out there as Robert Price is, and he's a New Testament scholar. And now, the reason why I mention this, because when I show you variant readings, I want you to keep two things in mind. These variants do not mean we don't have an accurate stream of the Bible preserved. And mm -hmm. secondly, the different readings actually is a testimony everything's been preserved. What do I mean? Nothing has been lost. What we have is additions to the stream. Yep. So when you see two different readings, that tells you both readings are preserved, nothing lost. Now, our job is to determine which of the two is original. So you understand my point, right? Yep. I just want to make sure everyone got it. When you have, let's say, two different readings of a verse, that's, an, that's actually proof that both readings have been preserved. Nothing is lost. So the original wording of the original autographs preserved in the manuscripts. It's now determining which of the two readings is the original that the author wrote by inspiration. So there's nothing lost. And like I said, all your English versions, don't take my word for it. Pick up NIV, pick up New Revised Standard Version, King James. When you go, you'll see that they agree over 90% of the time because the manuscript tradition agrees over 90% of the time. High degree of agreement. Everyone got understand the point, right? So in these studies, we have to deal with variant readings. It comes up as part of our discussion of the Bible. So want to make sure I get some feedback because a lot of you guys are silent. I don't know what that means. And, and everybody here, we will try to later on down the line in the future, uh, bring James Snap on. He is incredible when it comes to this issue. We had him on, uh, I think maybe about a month and a half back. We'll, we'll bring him back on. Uh, we, he's a good friend of both of ours, he will agree with everything we've said here on the manuscript tradition. And I got it. One different reading shows, President. You got it because that means they're both there, extent, preserved, there not lost. Wonderful, Hannah. Glory to God. Everyone else got it too? Just at least let me make sure that you can say, yeah, we get it. Okay, that's okay. You can just say one. Good. I just want to make sure. All right. Why, why did I mention that? Because I'm going to show you something. I want you to go to the New Revised Standard Version, Mark 1, verse 2. See, the, you have to read with understanding, not just read fast. Notice verse 2. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Notice how it begins. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Can you look at the Dewey Reigns? Oh, yeah. The Dewey Rhymes or Dewey Reigns? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Dewey Reigns? Yeah, Dewey Reigns. Okay. Watch here. Dewey Reigns. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. Okay. Now I want you to catch the new King James. As it is written in the prophets. Oh. No. Did you catch it? Did Mark say as it is written in Isaiah the prophet? Or did he say as it is written in the prophets plural? Now the Dewey Reigns, based on Latin Vulgate, Jerome translated from the Greek manuscripts that said Isaiah the prophet. Because Isaiah the prophet is very old. It has very old attestation. But the majority of the Greek witnesses that start forming the majority later on read prophets. Now, can anyone discern why the difference? So you guys, I'm trying to help you also go deep into the scripture. So I hope you guys are still enjoying the discussion. It's fantastic. I've got to ask you this, brother. I'm curious. What, what is the oldest tradition there? Is the oldest Isaiah or prophets in Greek? What would the Byzantine have? Do you know? 
the Byzantine would have prophets, but okay. you have church fathers that quote both uh, forms. Gotcha. Prophets and Isaiah. I believe, don't quote me here, I'm going by memory, but you'll be able to verify. I believe Irenaeus, there's a citation where he quotes it as prophets. Don't quote me here. You're the expert on the fathers, but the I'll fathers, that. you'll find them quoting both form, right? You're right. So, so you see that here now? Hannah got it. Why would it? Why would it read prophets? Because he didn't quote Isaiah only. He quoted Malachi and Isaiah, and he quoted Isaiah, prophets. But what if the original reading is Isaiah? Did Mark make a mistake? Because he's quoting Malachi and Isaiah, is he making a mistake? No, because you'll find a pattern in the New Testament where two different prophets who prophesy in respect to the same theme, where their prophecies is attributed to the one with greater messianic or prophetic significance. Meaning, though he's quoting Malachi, Malachi is shorter, Isaiah is the bigger book and has more messianic themes run, running along his book. So it was a practice where you would attribute the writings of two different prophets to one particular prophet because that one particular prophet has a greater messianic theme running through his prophetic book. And so that later prophetic statement is subsumed under that one prophet. Look at this, oh, brother. You're not kidding. Tois prophetais. There we go. The prophets. You're right. In the Byzantine, but clearly look look above. We've got the variant right here as well, where we've got Isaiah there. Yep. Look at that. So so incredible. I um I was not aware of that variant there. Very interesting. So those who believe Isaiah's original explain that the reason why prophets became dominant is because maybe a scribe or scribes thought there was an error in their copy and thought they were now going to have to correct that error so that their copy was defective. It wrongly read Isaiah, so they changed it to prophets. Who's not getting it? I don't want to move on if they're not getting it. Everybody, one other thing. Rather than perhaps uh, challenge you in a negative way, this should confirm your faith more than anything else. And there's a reason why Sam is also focusing on Mark 1. Let me, let me tell you one thing real quickly. You will find Muslims, you will find um, a number of non-believing groups that want, to, want you to point them where the deity of Christ can be found in the New Testament. And even though we may not agree with them in the order of them saying Mark is the oldest, really, it doesn't really matter, they will demand that you show them Show me that Jesus is God Almighty from the oldest gospel. Don't show me from John. The Bible, you know, that's evolved by then. People, you know, believe all sorts of garbage by then. Show me in Mark. What has Sam just done for you? He's unveiled clearly the language showing that Christ is Yahweh, is God Almighty. I mean, they can't refute that, brother. There's no way they can. So what they do, like he said, they'll try to say, see, well, you have a contradiction, Mark, Isaiah, that tells you you can't trust Mark. He's not inspired. Yeah. He made a historical mistake. So they see it's powerful as a witness to Jesus being the God of the Old Testament, the flesh. So then they want to destroy your confidence in the historicity and accuracy of that document. So you don't believe what Mark says. Well, if Mark is wrong here, why should I trust what he has to say about Jesus? See, the, you understand, right? So whether you like it or not, you got to be familiar with these variant readings. It's there. But what's the beauty? Neither reading is lost, it's both there. If Isaiah's original, that's not a problem because historically, and it's even evidenced by the New Testament itself, you'll find writers like Matthew taking two different prophetic statements and subsuming it under the head of one prophet, attributing to one prophet, because <clears throat> though they're two prophets, they're all prophesying about the same theme, the same advent, and oftentimes... If it's a, what we call a minor prophet, not that he's minor in significance, maybe a smaller book that doesn't have as much of a messianic theme running throughout its book because it's smaller, then that prophet's prophetic statement will be subsumed under the category of that other prophet whose book is larger and has more to say about Messiah or end times. And you'll find that Matthew doing that in Matthew 27, verses 9 to 10. 
Because Matthew takes the prophecy of Zechariah 11 with a prophecy in Jeremiah and attributes it both to Jeremiah in Matthew 27, 9 and 10. And we'll talk about Matthew 27, 9 and 10 later, but you'll see he does that there too. Matthew 27, 19. The prophecy is an allusion to Jeremiah 19 and a citation of Zechariah 11, but he attributes it to Jeremiah. Then was fulfilled, was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. That's actually a citation of Zechariah 11, 12 to 13, but he's combining it to Jeremiah because the complete understanding of the prophecy is found in Jeremiah 19, specifically if you look at four. So are you seeing a pattern here? Jeremiah 19. Okay, because what happens here? Because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place because they have burned incense to, in it to other gods whom neither they, their fathers, nor the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. And what was the field called? That Judas, that Judas' uh, 30 pieces of silver was used to buy because they bought a field, the potter's field, and they called it the field of blood because Jesus' blood was shed, the blood of the innocent. Amazing. Right? If you read Matthew 27... When Jer Judas betrays Jesus, he's given 30 pieces of silver. He's convicted at heart, and he throws it back at them and says, I betrayed innocent blood. They took the 30 pieces of silver and bought a field, and it was called the field of blood, Akeldama, the blood of the innocent. Sinking in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, this Bible is supernatural, supernaturally deep. I know Samantha's enjoying it. She's, I can see her writing her notes down. <laughs> Jeremiah 19 and then Zechariah 11. Combine it together with Matthew 27. Right? Notice it's, it's called, the place is called the blood of innocence. An allusion to what happened with Jesus when Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. The price mentioned is Zechariah 11. And then handed it to the religious rulers of, of Jerusalem who then took the 30 pieces of silver, silver, bought a field and called it the field of blood. Because why? That was the money used, right, to betray innocent blood, the blood of innocent. Everyone got it before I move on? No, because this texting doesn't stop. All right, now when that said, what's the point? Jeremiah 23 says, the branch of David is a physical human king who rules in Jerusalem. But then we're told elsewhere in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel and Zechariah, it's the Lord God Almighty whose throne will be in Jerusalem, who will be dwelling there, whom the nations must come and behold his face there as he reigns as king over all the earth. How do we reconcile that? Because the branch of David is not a mere human being. He's God in the flesh. So why then do the Jews object to our belief that Jesus is Messiah, who's the God-man, God in the flesh, when the Hebrew Bible teaches the same thing? Yep. Everyone got that so far? We're going to go into other aspects, but I want to make sure you got that so far. The Old Testament is a puzzle. It's a perplexing puzzle for Jews who don't believe in the Trinity or Jesus as the God-man. Because they have prophecies saying, God will come and reign, and he will reign as the one king over the earth. But then the son of David is coming to reign, and he'll reign in Jerusalem over the earth. How? Because God is the Messiah, and God becomes the son of David, a human physical descendant of David, to fulfill the promises he gave to David. So let's, let's wrap this up again by looking at another prophecy in Jeremiah that I mentioned last week, but now I want to see if you have the solution for it. Go to Jeremiah 23 again, one more time, verses 5 to 6. Okay. Behold, the days are coming, say, says the Lord, pay attention, that I will raise to David a, a branch of righteousness and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. And this is his name by which he will be called, Jehovah is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness, right? So it's the branch of David that God raised up, not David. 
This is repeated later on in Jeremiah 33. Because I'm going to ask you guys a question. Because this came up last session. But we went on heavenly Jerusalem, so we didn't combine all these together. Okay, in Jeremiah 33, 15 to 16. Watch here. Okay, watch here. In those days, and at that time, I'll cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. Same thing. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she shall be called. This is more accurate. I like this. Notice the name is in italics. It's italicized. That means it's not in the Hebrew. By which she will be called the Lord our righteous. And that's a feature of the New King James and the King James. King James and New King James will italicize words, not in the original language, but they supply for greater clarity. That's what I like. Okay? Now, now we know why Jerusalem is called the Lord our righteousness, because God is coming to live there. We know why Jerusalem is called the Lord is there, because God is coming to dwell there. We know why Jerusalem is called the throne of the Lord, because God is coming to dwell there. So Jerusalem is called the Lord because... It's being named after her, her king who comes to live in his city. Now, folks, let me ask you a question. Why is the physical human branch of David called the Lord our righteousness? So I know why the city is called the Lord our righteousness, because the Lord God is living in the city. The city becomes his dwelling place where he lives there. He'll take up his residence there. His throne will be there, and he'll reign from there. So the city is being named after her, her king who lives there. But why is the human, physical the son of David called the Lord our righteousness? What's the answer? Well, no, Jesus is not Melchizedek. Well, well, we've explained why he's not, but we'll look at it again. What's the answer? Why is the human, you got it, Samantha. Very now, good. why is he called the Lord our righteousness? I know he's the branch of David, but why is this human branch called the Lord our righteousness? We know why Jerusalem is called that. Because God will live in the city. The city is being named after the king who lives there. Why is this human branch of David called the Lord, Job, our righteousness? Samantha got it. What else is getting it? Yeah, Thomas. Thomas got it. Because he is God in the flesh, the God-man. Two natures united in one person. Yes, Hannah. He's the human God, the God-man. God who became... Yeah. And this is Old Testament. Okay, but now let's see if we can now reconcile Jeremiah 30, verse 9, which is what we started with last session. Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Okay, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I'll raise up for them. Okay, now I'm confused. Earlier in Jeremiah 23, God will raise up for David a branch who will reign. And then later on in Jeremiah 33, he repeats it. But here he says, it's David that I will raise up for them. And they will serve David like they'll serve me. Is Jeremiah confused? Jeremiah, what are you doing to us, man? Is it David that's going to be raised to reign? Or is it the branch of David that God will raise up? What's the answer? Who's getting it? Okay, so then why does it say David here? You got it, Thomas. Thomas got it. Because David is one of the names of Messiah. Yep. That's one of his names. And why is he called David? Because like David, he's the king of Israel. Like David, he's a physical human descendant of Judah. That's why he can be called David, because like David, he's human. He's an Israelite from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David, and he's king. That's why he can also be called Jehovah, because like God, his father, he's divine. He has the nature of his father, and therefore is fully God like his father is. So like his human father, David, meaning his ancestor, he didn't sire him. You, you know what I mean, because Mary was from the line of David. Yep. Like his human father, David, he is human. He's a descendant of Judah and king. So he can be called David in that sense. And like 
his divine father, right? He is God in nature and therefore can be called Jehovah, who is just as righteous as his divine father. I want to give you a minute for it to sink in. Samantha, you're doing amazing. You're getting it because this is going to help you witnessing to your Jewish relatives. You don't need to ever touch the New Testament. Just have them explain. Say, can you explain this for me, please? Yep. This also shows you why David is being served with the same service given to God. They shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. Because he's not a mere human creature. He's God in the flesh, the God-man, and worthy of the same service that the Lord God receives. <laughs> Jeremiah, what are you doing to us? <laughs> what is the Greek there in, in, the, in the Septuagint, brother? Are you aware of the proskuneo or lecturo? It, it would be duleo, I believe, not proskuneo. Okay, duleo, okay. Septuagint? It should be duleo. Yeah, let me see. Jeremiah 30, 30 verse 9, right? Yeah, Jeremiah 30, verse 9. Now, I don't know if the Septuagint has a different form of Jeremiah because I know there's a longer recension, and I don't know if it affects Jeremiah 30. I have no idea because this is, yeah. Is that Take the longer up. recension? Yeah, it does. It does affect it. Yeah, because it. you see it says Jeremiah 49, 15. Yeah. It. So, yeah, because remember, there's a longer recension of Jeremiah. There's a shortened form and a longer That's form. That's right. Both are preserved. Yeah. Let me see, man. Hold on. There's an easy way of me to find out. Hold on, guys. You guys, I'm telling you, what you're getting with William, I'm not exaggerating. Seminary stuff, even seminaries don't teach you this stuff. I'm not exaggerating. Not at all. You guys are not, I mean, and, and as Sam well, knows, Sam shows you the Bible, then we delve into the fathers. You guys don't find this stuff anywhere. We're not bragging. We're just, uh, we're, we're sharing with you many years of experience of what we've done, we've been doing, we've been debating. Um, we've, uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Spoiled little children. No, I'm just kidding. I joke around. We've been doing this since the dinosaurs roamed. Let's see what the Septuagint is. Uh, oh, and the Septuagint is Jeremiah 37, 9. 37, 9. 30, yeah. let me see. And it doesn't have, it says, K ergontai to kerio theo auton ke ton David basileia auton anestesio anesteso Oh, toys. There is no word for duleo or lotruo or proskuneo. Very odd. Yeah. What about the Latin? What about the Dewey Rames? Let me check it out. Yeah. I, is, will it be the same, Jeremiah 37 19 in the Dewey Rames? 37 19? That was in the, the Septuagint. It's 37 19. The Hebrew, it's 30 verse 9. So does the Latin Vulgate go out with the Septuagint? No, no, it's the Hebrew, right? Because Jerome quoted from Hebrew, right? He quoted from Hebrew. Remember that whole debate with Augustine? Yeah, yes. he qu quoted from the Hebrew. So it'll be Jeremiah 30, verse 9, Hebrew recension. Yeah, we've got the Dewey Rams right here. What would the Latin be? 30, verse 9. I can pull up the Vulgate right here. Latin. Here we go. Vulgate. Latin Vulgate. Jer uh... Bear with us, guys. Trust, trust us. This is worth it. This is worth waiting for. Verse 9. Here we go. Uh, I, I, I'm unable to read Latin, but it's uh, right yeah. here. I see, I see Domino Deo. So, and it's, I see David. Yep. But I'm not a Latin reader either, so I don't know what it says, to be honest. Someone read Latin? Oh, yeah, it says serve right there. It does serve. right there. There it is. Yeah. So it yep. does say serve, but it doesn't tell us what the Greek would be. Right. Yeah, I can, I, can t I can see that, though. It does have serve there. Okay. I don't know why the Septuagint diverged. That's weird. That is odd. You're right about that. By the way, everybody, we're looking at serve because sometimes uh, the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, at times it has latruo or duluo, which are important words to hammer home our point. Um, and even though it, does, it may not have it here, there are other passages that we've shown you all, such as in Daniel chapter 7, which do have that all-important Greek word, latruo, applied to the Son of Man. The Son of Man is who? Christ. Christ is due the worship that is due to God alone. 
Now, for the rest of you, you understand that in, in prophecy, Messiah has many names. One of his names was David, right? You guys got it now. So if someone tells you, how do you know that's not the historical David being re resurrected? Because Jeremiah earlier and later tells us the one that God is raising is the branch of David. So that means David has to be a name for Messiah. Why? Because David typifies Messiah. And if you guys want, I can show you patterns where David typifies Messiah in that David is called the son of God and he's called God's firstborn who is to reign over the kings of the earth whom God promised to give him the nations as an inheritance. All of which is fulfilled in Jesus only, not in the historical David. Yep. You guys want me to show you those verses? Where David is said to be God's firstborn, highest kings of the earth, the one whom God will enthrone over the earth. If you guys are interested, I can show you that. Show you why the Messiah would be called David. Because what was said of David is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. David is a type of Christ. Okay, so let's go to Psalm 89, 19 and 20. Who is God talking about there? Psalm 89, 19 and 20. Now watch here. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I've exalted one chosen from the people. I found my servant David with my holy oil. I've anointed him. Now, we'll just read 21 to 27, okay? With whom my hand, with whom my hand, did we skip some? Go back to 19, brother. Oh, oh no, no, bad. sorry. You're right. No, no, you're right. It was 21. Okay. With whom my hand will be established, shall be established. Also, my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. In my name, his authority, his sovereignty will be established. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. Remember that phrase. He shall cry to me. You are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. If I didn't tell you that this was about David, you think he's not about Jesus. Everyone getting it? But it's not about Jesus. It's about David. God's promises to David that Jesus fulfills. So like David, Jesus is from Judah, from the line of David. And as a man, God is his father. And like David, he's the beloved son of God. Like David, he's the firstborn. And like David, he's the highest of the kings of the earth like David. Now notice the promise he goes that I will set his hand, notice 25, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. Go to Zechariah 9 verses 9 to 10. Maria, you have any questions, my sister? If you have, ask. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 9 verses 9 to 10. Let me just read this and I have questions one ten. Now this is not talking about the historical David. When Zechariah wrote, David had been dead for 500 years. Yep. Zechariah is writing about 500 years after the death of David. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now watch. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the rivers, from the river to the ends of the earth. Does that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like what God said to David in Psalm 89, 25? But now that promise is extended to the king who's coming to ride the foal of a donkey. I want to park there and let it sink in so you can simmer on it before we go to another topic. Still rated to Jesus, the Messiah, being the God man from the Hebrew Bible. Any, does anybody have anything on their mind? Any question? Yeah. I mean, maybe yeah, anybody actually, might be confused. I, I did have a question. I, I, I sent you a message. Um, is there a difference between the title David and son of David? Because I remember the beggar in the New Testament used the uh, son of David. Sure. Is that different from David? Yes. Son of David means he's a descendant of David. But when he's called David, why is he called David? Because he's not actually David reincarnated, right? So in those days, then anybody could have been son of David. Yes. Man, okay. so David had many sons. Right? Joseph is from the household of David. He's a son of David. Yep. Right? James, you with me there, brother? Was that James who asked me? Yeah, yeah I'm with you. Yeah, so you're getting it? 
Yeah, so that so is a descendant of David. Okay, so it doesn't have a messianic um, no. title. No. Okay. To be Messiah, you have to be the son of David. Yep. Okay. You with me there? Yeah. To be the Messiah, you have to be the son of David. But if you're son of David, that doesn't mean you're necessarily the Messiah because David had many sons. But among the sons, one would be chosen to sit on the throne. The being, being from the line of David, James, doesn't in turn automatically mean one is the Messiah. Yes. You get it? So is that clear now, David, or are you still... I mean, uh, James, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So why is then the branch called David when he's not physically David? Because David is a picture of the branch, and the, David and the branch have similarities so that he can bear the name of David, because what is true of David is true of Messiah, but in a greater sense. Right? Greater sense. So I want this to sink in. And folks, if I had time, maybe in the future, if God keeps me healthy enough and holy enough not to dis disappoint the Lord and never, in Jesus' name, turn away from the Lord, never. May I stay in love, all of us stay in love with Jesus till the end by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll show you how every major character in the Hebrew Bible is a picture of Jesus. Yeah. Everyone. I'm not exaggerating. Everyone. Do you guys want me to show you how Solomon is a picture of Jesus? Who's interested in that? All right, Maria's life interested. Okay. Let me just, again, recap Jesus, who he is. He's God's son, right? He's a son of God. He's beloved of the Father, and he's the Prince of Peace and our peace, right? Do I need to show that from New Testament? We already know that. We already know that, right? He's the son of God. He is the beloved of the Father. He's the Prince of Peace and our peace, right? And he's the one who builds the temple of God, meaning the church, right? When he poured out the Holy Spirit and built the church. What do you say in Matthew 16, 18? And on this rock, I'll build my church. And the ch church is what? The temple of God, right? Do I need to establish on New Testament? It's up to you guys. I don't mind. I'll give you the verses. But if not, then I'm going to show you how Solomon is a picture of Jesus. So, um, sorry, talking about the, the church, was that uh, a new term that Jesus used? No. Or what, what was that? Because the Jews don't have church, right? Yes, they do. They have it. It's in the Hebrew term. But you're using a Christian term. They're not going to know it. No. The word is kahel, assembly, Greek ekklesia. Yep. So when you tell a Jew a church, you're speaking a foreign language. But if you tell them kahel, mm. that's the Hebrew term. Can I prove to you they were having church in the Old Testament, sister? Yes, please. But here's the problem. Depends on what translation you read, because the English translation won't translate the word from which we get church from consistently. So you're going to miss it. So guess where, where you're going to be blessed by reading the King James, because the King James will tell you that church was already being observed, at least at the time of Moses. Acts 738 King James. Watch here, guys. You guys ask excellent questions, by the way. I'm impressed. I agree. Okay, now you're not in the King James because you are an anti-Protestant, Anglican, <laughs> anti-King James. You little heretic, you need to repent. No, King James. Guys, the King James will have some advantages that other translations don't have. It really does. I got to now see if the Dewey Range translates it the same way because if it does, that's phenomenal. This is talking about Moses at the Exodus. In order to prove it, we're going to read 37. Acts 7, 37, 38. And as Catholics, I'm telling you, don't denigrate the King James. It will bless you and help you in many ways. Oh, yeah. Here's one way. Here's one way. I'm going to read 37 so you can see. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Bam. Why did the King James translator translate a church? Because it's the same Greek word, ekklesia. That's where you get the word church from. So they were having church, church in the Old Testament. Acts 738. Here it is. Right there, ekklesia, right there. That's why Jesus never had to explain what the church was. They already knew what the church was. But here's where he blew them away. 
He says, it's my church. Because in the Old Testament, the church was known as the church of God. I wonder if the Dewey Rhymes has church there. Yeah, Anybody yeah, have a Dewey Rhymes with you? I'll, I'll go to it. I'll check it out. And is our Bible super... Guys, isn't it making you fall more in love with the Bible, honestly? Amen. Now we got to study this book, folks. Oh, there you go. Church. Even in the Dewey Rhymes, huh? There we go. I love me the Dewey Rhymes. I am, uh, I am biased. Yeah, and you see what sucks? The mo most modern translations... Because they translate as congregation. You don't make the con connection unless you're reading the Greek or know what the Greek says. Yep. You see? That's why I was telling you as Catholics, don't go with your new American, American Bible. Go with the Dewey Rames and even the King James. And you'll be shocked how much agreement there is between the King James and the Dewey Rames. Am I saying Rames right or is it Rhymes? I think it's Rhymes. I think it's Rhymes. Rames? Okay. So we are, well, anyway, if it rhymes with Rames, then we'll take Rames as long as it rhymes. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. All right. Everyone got it? So everyone got it there, right? Church wasn't something new. They were having it in the Old Testament. But what was new is a Jew comes and says, it's my church. For the Jews, if he wasn't God, that's blasphemy. What do you mean, my church? You'll never find it said to be the church of Moses, the church of Isaiah, the church of Jeremiah. It's the church of Yahweh. And Jesus says, it's my church. Who do you think you are? So that's even a subtle affirmation that he's God to call it my church. Okay, I want that to sink in for a minute. All right, now when you get that, uh, do I need, is, is, is it clear that uh, Jesus built the church, which is the temple of God, right? We know that, right? Or do you guys, if you want verses, I'll give you the verses. I don't care. I just want to know if you need the verses, I'll give it to you. Or if not, we'll just go into how Solomon is a parallel of Jesus. You guys want those verses? Jesus built the church here. Matthew 16, 18, built my church. And that church is a temple of God. Matthew 16, 18. Okay, so we know that one, right? You guys should know that. You're Catholic. You better I'm know that one, rock. Catholics. Yeah, come on now. I'm part of this rock. I'll build my church. But what is the church? Let's go to Ephesians 2. And here we'll kill two birds with one stone. Jesus is our peace, the Prince of Peace, who makes peace and unites Gentiles and Jews into one body, the temple of God, which is the church. So we're going to start Ephesians 2, verse 11, all the way to 22. Okay. For which cause, <clears throat> be mindful that you being heretofore Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision. The Jews who are physically circumcised call you uncircumcised because you don't get physically circumcised, right? Called circumcision of flesh made by hands. That you were, you Gentiles, at that time without Christ. You didn't have Jesus. Being aliens from the conversation, citizenship with Israel. You had nothing to do with Israel. And strangers to the Testament. You had nothing to do with their covenant because the covenant was for Israel. You had nothing to do with it. You had no hope in the promise. And you had no God in this world because you didn't worship the true God. But now, now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were afar off are made nigh, brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, took the Jews and Gentiles, made them one body, breaking down the middle wall of partition that separated them, the enmities in this flesh, because the Jews hated the Gentiles, Gentiles hated the Jews. Making void the law of commandments, those commandments that condemned you, accursed you, and cut you off from God because of breaking those commandments, contained in decrees that he, made, might, that, he made, that he might make the two in himself into one new man, Making peace, sees our peace. He made peace between us and with God and might reconcile, reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, killing the enmities in himself. And coming, he preached peace to you that were afar off and peace to them that was near. Meaning you Gentiles and the Jews, he brought peace to both of you and made you one and brought peace between God and you. Now here's where it comes in. What's the church? For by him, we have access both in one spirit to the Father, the Trinity there. By him, the Son, one spirit, the Father. So you see, Jesus, Spirit, Father, the Trinity, working together. Trinity, working together. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the domestics of God, the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now let's look at 21, 22. Okay, watch here. 
in whom all the building, so you're the temple, being framed together, growth up into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together into habitation of God in the Spirit. So that we establish it now. Jesus builds the spiritual temple of God, which is his church, which is his bride, which is his body, born of the Spirit. So what did Jesus do? He builds the spiritual temple of God. What did he make for us? Peace. He brought us peace. He brought us rest. Rest between Jews and Gentiles who hated each other and rest in peace with God. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Because I'm going to show you how it ties in with Solomon. Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. I will give you peace. I will give you rest. I will refresh you. So do we establish it, right? Jesus is God's son. God loves him. Jesus is our peace, our rest. He gives us rest. He gives us peace. He builds us into a spiritual temple where God lives by his spirit. And that temple is Jesus' spiritual body, the church, his bride. Everyone with me, amen? I don't need to prove that. We got it. I don't want to move on until you guys say, okay, we got it. We got it. All right. If you got it, how is this a picture of Solomon? Or how is Solomon a picture of Jesus? First Chronicles 29 verse 1, what does Solomon build? And King David said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is as yet young and tender, and the work is great, for a house is prepared not for man but for God. So Solomon builds the temple of God. Who is Solomon also? 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. Notice who he is. But the Lord God is of Israel chose me of all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For of Judah he chose the princes, and of the house of Judah my father's house. And among the sons of my father it pleased him to choose me king over Israel. Now watch. And among my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So who sits on God's throne on earth? Solomon. Who sits on the Father's throne in heaven? Jesus. Okay, now but watch who he is. Verse 6. And he said to me, Solomon, thy son, shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be a father to him. So wow, like Jesus, Solomon is a son of God. Like Jesus, Solomon builds the temple of God. Like Jesus, Solomon sits on the, on the throne of God. Hmm. Any more similar similarities? First Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. And David said to Solomon, My son, it was my desire to have built a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, Thou hast shed much blood and fought many battles, so thou canst, you cannot build a house to my name, David, because you killed too many people, you shed too much blood. After shedding so much blood before me, the son that shall be born to thee shall be a most quiet man, for I'll make him rest from all his enemies round about, and therefore he shall be called peaceable. What will he be called? Peaceable. Hebrew Shlomo. Solomon comes from the Hebrew word Shlomo. And it comes from the root word Shalom. So call him Shlomo because he will give you Shalom. I will give peace and quietness to Israel in all his days. He shall build a house to my name and he shall be a son to me and I will be a father to him and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Okay guys, he's called Shlomo, peaceable. Because in his days, God will give his people rest and peace. Shalom. He's God's son. Sits on God's throne and builds God's temple. Sound like somebody you know? Wow. Oh, but now, guys, that's nothing yet. Many people don't know Solomon has two names. He's got another name, but you don't hear it. God gave him two names. He gave him Sh Shlomo, and he named him Yedidiah. 2 Samuel 12, 24, 25. Yedidiah. You know what that means? Yedidiah? 
the one that Yahweh loves, the beloved of Yahweh. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and slept with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and called his name Amiable to the Lord. Hebrew, Yedidiah, Jedidiah, because the Lord loved him. So notice he's called Shlomo because he's peaceable. He's called Jedidiah because he's the beloved of the Lord. He's the son of God who sits on God's throne, who builds God's house. And in his days, God gave rest and peace to his people. Jesus, the beloved of God, the one whom God loves, the son of God who sits on God's throne, who build, builds God's spiritual temple, who gives rest and peace to God's people, and he's the prince of peace and our peace. Bam! For that, I got to warm up my coffee. Give me a minute, brother. No problem, brother, at all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab me a diet drink as well. Everybody, uh, let that Bang. sink in. It'll be about 30, 45 seconds. Bam, guys. Bam. Yeah, that's member. That's a translation of the Latin. What's a translation of Hebrew? You, he's going to show you the translation from Hebrew. It's beloved of Yahweh. Yahweh loves him. Jedediah. Yedediah. He'll show it to you in a minute. Guys. Okay, now let me ask you a question. What more proof do you want this Bible supernatural? It's divine in origin. It is historically accurate. You can believe that these events are true events that took place in history because the God of history <clears throat> ordained these events and recorded these events as accurate history to point to a greater event, Jesus. You see, the Bible is proof that the God of the church is real because the Bible is supernatural. Why do you think you have so-called clergymen trying to destroy your faith in the Bible because Satan is using wolves to get you doubt the Bible so your faith is weak and it's not strong. I am back. Sorry about that, brother. You can understand? And it's not just Catholic clergy, Protestant clergy, or Satan is raising up wolves in sheep's clothing in in the garb of clergymen, because you assume, well, he's clergy. He must be telling me the truth. You want your faith destroyed? Read the notes to the New American Bible Revised Edition. Yep. I, I, can, I can tell people in here, and I've said it uh, a number of times. In, in the USA, the state of our seminaries in Catholicism is a cesspool. Um, I don't mean that all of them are, are liberal, but you either have liberalism if you don't have liberalism, you have very, very poorly educated people that don't know the doctrine of the Trinity, don't yeah. know Mariology, don't know things that would have been elementary back in the, as early as the 1800s. They would have been elementary. I mean, today you, you, you maybe talk to um, a deacon or a priest, you, you like the likelihood, and I'm not, I'm, I'm being fair here, Sam knows that I'm not the kind of person that I'm only going to take aim at Protestantism. I'd be an idiot to do that. You have likelihood of running into a priest or a deacon that if I, I, wa I want you to test this. If you ever do, it's likely that you might ask him, is Christ eternal God? Was he created? Be shocked if you wouldn't run into one or two of them that would tell you, well, yeah, you know, he was created and not understanding the doctrine of the Trinity. I guarantee you, you would. Folks, I'm not exaggerating when I say I've had to refute Catholic scholars because Muslims use them. You know who oh, yeah. was the biggest thorn in my side in the 90s? Was the late Raymond Brown, who was a Catholic. Was he a priest? He was a priest. And um, let, let me as, as, make your point, and then I want to yeah. I want to tell something to people here that's going to shock them. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you. I want you to watch a session. I don't know how people feel about it, but I'm going to share a session with you. But 
Raymond Brown was a priest that Muslims use because Raymond Brown's theories of the Bible are the most destructive theories out there. He will destroy your confidence in the authority of Scripture. Now, I don't know, I don't know, William, I've never asked you this, but I'm going to ask you. I brought Robertson Genesis. I know some people may not like his geocentricism, but I'll tell you what. That man has the highest view of Scripture. Friend he of mine, very good friend of mine. Say it again. Very good friend of mine. Okay, good. So you're all right with it because I know some people. Oh, he's a very about. close friend of mine. Good. Robert Genesis. He is a diehard, diehard Trinitarian Catholic apologist, one of the most brilliant minds, who has the most highest view of scripture. He did a session for me on Sola Scriptura. Listen to it. Listen to how he I need to go hear that. scholarship, uh, Catholic scholarship, and how destructive they are, and how he shows their views is not the view of the Catholic Church historically. It's not. Don't be deceived by the clergy to tell you. This is what the Catholic Church teaches. No, it does not. Historically, it's taught. The Bible is 100% historically accurate. Oh, yeah. And it's the inspired and infallible Word of God. Listen if if there is one book. thing that I have, and I can tell you from the very beginning of, of when I began doing apologetics, I, I don't care if people hate Bob's, uh, Robert's uh, geocentrism. I don't care. Exactly. We're talking about his theology. If we stick to Robert's theology, the guy is rock solid, yes. and he will tell you to your face that if you don't believe the Bible is inerrant, then you don't know Catholic theology, period. And um, you, you bring up a really good point here, brother, and I want to I wanna share it with people here in this group. When you bring up Raymond Brown, I know people have, have been attending our classes, and we've, Raymond Brown has really taken it in the chin, but for good reason. For people that maybe not have not heard... I'll give you the rundown. Raymond Brown was a priest who, for many years, was considered one of the top of the top scholars in the universe. Sam knows I'm not lying. People would look to Raymond Brown to hear about the Gospels, the historicity of how Christ died, the resurrection, and what have you. And, you know, let me just be quite honest with you. He was... Um, he was not a very good uh, um, at expounding Catholic teaching at all. He was not good at all. The book that I just co-wrote with, um, with Father Coppins on Mariology, what we did in our book was, before writing it, we said we need to really refute Raymond Brown and his distortion on Mary. Because Raymond Brown, number one, denies key teachings, not just on Mary, but key teachings on the incarnation, teachings that are fundamental to your faith. So we said, we, we really want to uh, refute him without being rude and without losing charity. A lot of the stuff that we take head on in our book is Raymond Brown. Well, when we sent our book for endorsements, one of the people that we sent it to was Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn wrote back to me about three days ago, giving me, actually about five days ago, giving me his full endorsement for the book. And he said, I know you guys didn't write it out in plain words, but I could tell that you were really upset with the scholarship of Raymond Brown. He said, I am on board. He said, I think Raymond Brown did a lot of damage rather than good. I used to use his uh, citations in trying to critique certain Catholic doctrines like the perpetual virginity of Mary because he edited a book on marrying the New Testament. Yep. So I used to use that as well. So he's done a lot of damage. Now, real quickly about St. Genis, we're going to go back to the point. St. Genis, you may think he's wacko, but he's a brilliant mind, and there are brilliant scientists, brilliant, who are geniuses when it comes to science. And so oh, yeah. they haven't come to geocentricism in ignorance. But put that aside. Let me tell you why St. Genis is so geocentric. He spoke. He believes that the Catholic Church believed historically in geocentricism, and he believes scientific fact supports that. So it's his love for the Catholic Church and his understanding of that position that leads him to defend it. So this guy's doing it out of his love for the church. So don't look down on him. You may disagree with him. I, I, I'll, I'll take his side on geocentricism than the liberal clergy who believe in heliocentricism and attack the Bible as myth and full of errors and contradictions. I'll tell you I'd one thing. For, for anybody, and I, and I know Thomas probably saw it already, but we had, uh, we had St. Genesis on the show, and uh, we had an atheist try to go at him 
and try to refute him. And I know Thomas knows what I'm talking about. So Genesis wiped the floor with him. He'll wipe them out with evolution oh, too. Yeah. He would Drew. destroy I evolution. Remember. Drew. And, uh, can you just quickly, de- quickly define geocentrism? Sorry. Yeah, I cannot. Ignorance. I don't know enough to. Well, I, basically that the, the sun would revolve around the earth, not the earth around the sun. That's yeah, one but of I think the, he oh, wants okay. us to defend it. I don't know enough to defend it. Yeah, not that he was saying, what is it? He was oh, my bad. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's basically what it is. I but, apologize. So Genesis is a beast. His, this, his uh, refutation of macroevolution, he obliterates it. The dude is a genius. He's not a joke. But let me again explain why. Put it in perspective. Because of his love for the church and because of his love for what he believes the church taught about this issue, he, stu- de- he delved into science with a passion to show scientific facts do not support Galileo. He even has a book saying Galileo is wrong. And he's gone, out, he's gone at it against scientists that are well-learned. And <laughs> he's yeah. on another level. Not I'll tell joke. everybody not here. So yeah, Genesis that, is incredible, and yeah. he is humble, and he's a lover of Christ. Yeah. And by the way, his, his, his argument's above my program. I can't understand it. I have to go to, just to college to understand the terminology. That's how brilliant the guy is. But why do I mention him? Amen. Passionately in love with the Bible. Firm, 100% historically accurate. No errors, no myth. Inspired, and inerrant, infallible, because that's the position. I only mention that to show you. Don't take my word for it. Here, can I give you... Well, not because he didn't go into it too depth. Just go into the American Bible, revised edition notes. Read what they say about Genesis. They'll tell you it's folklore, animal fables being used to teach a moral point. From the start, they start attacking the very foundation of your faith. You don't need New American Bible, uh, revised edition, nor its notes. Stay away from it. Go back to the... If English is hard on you... Read a translation that doesn't have these critical notes attached to it. But if you can read English, start perfecting your ability to write, read Shakespearean English because Dewey Rames and King James are Shakespearean English. And there are nuggets there you're not going to catch in modern versions because of their assumptions. Now, with that said, with that said, coming back to the issue because I got about 20 minutes and I got to do what I got to do. Don't forget what you just read all throughout. God Almighty is coming to reign in Jerusalem, not a creature. God Almighty is coming. But at the same time, the branch of David is coming. Well, how can God come to reign and be the only king of all the earth and the branch of David come? Because Jeremiah told you, the branch is Jehovah our righteousness. He's God in the flesh. One of the names of this branch of David is David. Why? Because David is a picture of Messiah. So was Solomon. Did you guys see how Solomon is a picture of David? Everyone saw that, right? I'm sorry, Solomon, picture of Jesus. I'm sorry. Well, he is a picture of David in that Jesus is called David. So technically, I was right. But everyone got it? Solomon, picture of Jesus. We saw the similarities, right? Now, you guys want to be blown away? Can I show you something else about Solomon? Now, you're going to have to read it on your own. You have to read it on your own. Can't read it now because time is up uh, for me anyway. So I want to cover a few more points and we'll move on to something else. I want you to take time and read 1 Kings chapters 10 to 11, both chapters, and then cross-reference them, write these down, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20, write these down, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20, and 1 Kings chapters 10 to 11. Why? Deuteronomy 17 says that when Israel enters the land and asks for a king, The king must be from their brothers. He can't be an alien. He must have a copy of the law and study it so he can be humble and not arrogant. The law keeps him humble. He cannot multiply gold or silver. He cannot take on multiple wives, lest those wives turn his heart from worshiping God. And he cannot go to Egypt and get horses from Egypt, lest he enters into a contract with Egypt. Now, Historically, archaeologically, archaeology has confirmed this. During that time, Egypt bred the best war horses. So when you wanted a horse for war, who did you go to? Egypt. So what is God saying? The king cannot go to Egypt to get horses because then he's going to have to enter into covenant relations with Egypt. I don't want that. I want to get Egypt out of your hearts. Right? Secondly, he can't multiple wives because if he has multiple wives, 
tendency is he's going to get multiple foreign wives. He's going to marry the daughters of foreign kings. And they're going to be worshiping gods and turn his heart away from Yahweh. Cannot multiple gold, multiply gold and silver lest he gets puffed up with his riches and depend on his riches, right? Can't do that, right? But what did Solomon do? He multiplies wives. He has 700 wives, 300 concubines, foreign wives. He starts worshiping their gods, goddesses, and sacrificing to them for sin. Second sin. He goes to Egypt and gets horses from Egypt, where he's not supposed to. Third sin, he multiplies gold and silver. Everything God said, yeah. don't do, Solomon did. But here's the most shocking part. In 1 Kings 10, let's see who's going to catch it. I'm smiling here. He would multiply, he would get gold, annual amount of gold, 666 talents of gold. Six, six, six. Say, Which verse is it? It's in 1 Kings 10. Scroll and you'll find it, brother. 666 is going to be there. When it comes to the, with the gold. 666. Okay, now. Right there, you passed it. You passed it. Right there, verse 14. How much talent of gold? And the weight of the gold that was brought to Solomon every year was 666 talents of gold. For those of you who don't know, Revelation 13, that's the yep. number of the beast. 666. The number of the Antichrist. In other words, wow. God is showing you that Solomon, when he is in covenant faithfulness, is a picture of Christ. But in his fall, he becomes a picture of the one who opposes Christ. Damn. Wow. That's amazing. Can you go to Revelation 13, 18 so they can see what the number of the beast is? Silence? Everyone went silent. Here is wisdom. He that hath understanding, let him count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and the number of him, of him is 666. Wow. Solomon, what happened to you? Even, even wisdom. Solomon was known for what? For his wisdom. wisdom. Hence, the Deuterocanonical book we have, Wisdom of Solomon. <laughs> Everybody catch that? I don't know if your silence means you're all shocked. Are you guys shocked? It, it, it really is mind-blowing. Also, I think Hebrews uses wisdom of Solomon to talk about Christ as wisdom. Yep, yep. yep. yep, yep. Sure Hebrews. does. Wisdom too. Yeah, in Hebrews. And not only that, he's referring to his wisdom 7 where it says wisdom is the radiance of God. Oh, yeah. Yep. Because uh, Hebrews 1.3, Christ is uh, said to be the Greek. Yep. By the way, everybody, that is a very important passage because the Father has connected that with the eternal generation of the Son. Beautiful the way they did that. Which one? It's not so much John is deliberately connected with Solomon. It's, just so, it's that God is doing it. God is showing you. Because that's the number of the beast, 666. And yep. if you wonder why three sixes, can I real quickly with the five minutes I have? Because do you know Revelation 13 is a proof of the Trinity? Oh, yeah. Because what does Satan like to do? He likes to mock God, mimic God, and set up a false form of Christianity so that people turn to that instead of the true for Christian faith, right? Yep. If you read Revelation 13, if you want, next week we can do that as proof of the Trinity. We can do it as part of the series. The Amen. deity of Christ Trinity. We can do that. But real quickly, let me give you a summary. If you read Revelation 13 quickly, uh, qu um, man, I'm getting tongue-tied. If you read it, read on your own because I only got about five minutes. I got to go to class. I got to do something. Uh, Solomon, I'm sorry, Solomon, yeah. the dragon, the serpent, raises up a human authority, a human ruler, and he invests all his power and authority in that human ruler. And that human ruler demands to be worshipped as God, and all the nations must worship him as God, and must worship his image and take his mark. Then there's another beast that arises, and that beast is the false prophet who does signs and wonders and miracles to make people worship the beast who's been vested with all the power of Satan. Now, here's what's amazing. It says that the false prophet, the other beast, makes an image of the first beast and breathes life into it, making it alive. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. So you see how 
The false prophet is assuming the role of the Holy Spirit and breathing life into an object and doing signs and wonders to convince people to worship the first beast. What's the work of the Holy Spirit? Breathe life into you and convince you to worship Jesus, who is the God-man invested with all the power and the authority of his father. Coincidence? Satan, the beast who's a ruler, who is the manifestation of Satan in human form, whom all must worship, who's the king of the earth, and the other beast who does miracles and breathes life into an image in order to point people to the first beast to worship him. And notice again how that false prophet is mimicking God. We are the image of God whom the Spirit breathed life into. So notice the number again. Satan, the human ruler, and the prophet. Three and only three. Why three and only three? Because they're mimicking the true Trinity. Father, Jesus, the human incarnation of God, fully invested with the authority of the Father, and the Holy Spirit who breathes life into God's images, us, and does miracles to convince us to worship Jesus. But now, the other connection. The beast, the first beast, we're told, suffered a mortal wound and he recovered, meaning he'll even mimic the resurrection of Christ. And when he recovers from that mortal wound, everyone will be convinced he's the one to worship him. Wow! Tell me the Bible's not supernatural. That was seen by the fathers as well. So, I, I do have a question, though. Um, if, uh, should I just wait? If, I don't want now, to, before you do that, now, you know, he blesses me when he says the fathers see that because I've not read the fathers. That tells me glory to God. At least the spirit is protecting me and guiding me. And, and I, will have, um, I will have those compiled as well for next week when we go deeper into it. So now let me recap because I got to go and I'll take this question real quickly. Satan, the first beast who's a human being, a ruler, who claims to be God, is invested by the power of Satan, whom all must worship and worship his image and take his number, his mark. The other beast is a false prophet who breathes life into the image of the beast, making it alive, and does signs and wonders to convince people to worship that human ruler. And the human ruler suffers a mortal wound and then recovers, mimicking the resurrection. Three and only three. God the Father sends Jesus in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh, fully invested with the power and authority of his Father and is the king of the earth. The Holy Spirit breathes life into God's human images, us, and does signs and wonders to convince us to worship Jesus. Jesus suffered a mortal wound and was raised and recovered from it. Now, notice it says you must take his mark, right? Do you know why he forces you to take that mark? Because Revelation 14, verse 1. He's mimicking the Godhead. In the very next chapter. And I beheld, and lo, a lamb stood upon Mount Sion, and with him... 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. So just like you need to be marked on your foreheads with the true name of the true God, the Antichrist will mark you on your forehead or on your right hand with his mark symbolizing his name, his power, his authority over your life. Wow. Incredible. Why only three and, only, uh, and three alone if God is not a trinity? And why is one of them a human being Claiming to be God in the flesh, who must be worshipped. If Jesus wasn't God in the flesh, the true God-man, worthy of worship. There you go. What's your question, James? Because I got to go. Oh, it's quick. I mean, it's, William can also answer it. There's, uh, some people believe that um, there might be some period of peace, so-called an era of peace. It's not millenarian. It's not that. Well, but that, that depends kind of on similar. your... James, that depends on your view of end times. Not everyone believes in a thousand-year reign of Christ literally taking place on earth. They believe it's symbolic. Yep. But I do believe that the Catholic Church does believe Antichrist will come forth, right, uh, William? Sure, they sure do. Yep. Yeah. So we'll, he will show up. There's an Antichrist. How will that happen? That's what Christians debate it. All you need to know, he will show up, and he'll claim to be God in the flesh, and he'll do signs and wonders to deceive people to think he's God in the flesh. But the miracles he does is by the power of Satan, empowering him to deceive people. And those of us who love Jesus truly and are born of the Spirit will be killed during that time. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Guys, I got to go. Pray for my miracle. Pray for my daughters. God, bring them to me. Absolutely, Provide for brother. us. Keep us healthy, holy, and love with him. The Lord set me free from these satanic restrictions that I still am experiencing for a short period of time. Pray. 
the Lord to at least be sooner than later to be completely free to serve him and for provision. And God willing, next week, we can go into Revelation 13 with greater depth if you want. Amen. Love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care, brother. I got to go. Brother, be safe. Talk to you soon. God bless you, brother. Be praying for you and your daughters. Amen. Thank you. All right, everybody. We will, as we do every week, um, if anybody does have to go, um, you can head out. But as you know, every week after Sam gives you uh, biblical biblical foundations, I um, supplement that with the fathers. And I've got a, a ton for you all. What I've begun doing, what we've been doing it little by little, um, we need to get to the early councils and we will get there. We're going to get there the upcoming week but we're building up to get to them. What do we mean by the early church councils? The early councils are very, very complex. There are a number of things that I have got to break down for you all uh, on the way over there. We will get to councils that predated Nicaea. We will get to the robber ones. What do, we mean, what do I mean by robber? I mean that there were councils the church did have that were heretical that were not accepted by orthodox christianity now what do i mean by orthodox i mean tiny o anybody in here knows knows that i when referring to apostolic christianity it encompasses more than just catholicism now some people might be scratching their head well how on earth are uh, you claim to be catholic catholic and you say the catholic church is the one catholic church well correct you, you've got to be a little bit careful in the way you describe that, because for quite some time, um, incredible, Arthur, very good, Syrian Orthodox. We've got a Syrian Orthodox here. So um, for a long time, we were all united. And when I say that, I'm not talking about um, Protestantism. Unfortunately, Protestantism are, are um, to be nicer. They're not part of the apostolic churches. Uh, we've got the Syriac churches, the Orthodox, um, Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Catholicism. Um, and I know Thomas is waiting, waiting for me to forget one church so he can, um, um, he can throw a, a tomato at my head. But you all know what I mean. By and large, I mean the Orthodoxes, the, the, the Catholicism um, from whatever part of the world within the ancient church. Um, at one point, we were all united. So I will build up to getting to the ecumenical councils of Nicaea, Constantinople. Yes, I will get to Chalcedon as well. Um, I will be getting to all of those councils. But before I get to them, and I'm gonna stop sharing my thing just for a second, because I need to find um, the document that I'm gonna show you all in a bit. Uh, before I get there, I need to build to it. I need to build until we get to the heretics in the early church. And um, why am I doing that? It is very important because if we are going to be talking to you all about the Trinity, you all are going to have to have a firm foundation. I'm trying to find, figure out where I am. Um... Okay, you all ha are going to have, a, to have a firm foundation when it comes to the early fathers. Another topic that I promised you all that I would be covering, and I'm going to be covering it, will be the filioque. That has been a very, very important point that a lot of people have requested. It is one that I think that there is just um, not a whole lot of information about out there. It is one that I think is crucial, and I think we need to talk about the filioque. Uh, we're not going to talk about it today, obviously, but it is crucial because in Catholicism, or even in Protestantism, the massive majority of Protestants are, would believe in the filioque. They would. They, may not, they might not even know it. They might not have any clue, but they believe in the, in the filioque. So... Are we gonna talk about the filioque? We are, we're gonna talk about it in the Bible, number one, because if we can establish it from the Bible, anything else is um, supplementary. We can show it from the Bible and the early church councils. Be patient because it is complex. The teaching of the Trinity in the early church is very, very important. I'm gonna go line by line with you all through, this, through the centuries. 
and we will begin with Justin Martyr today. We've already read Justin Martyr. We've read a lot of what Justin Martyr has to say, but I thought he was important to examine again today as we go throughout history. I'm not going to, yes, the filioque, Arthur, I'm not going too far into history because I want to stop before I get to the 300s. Why do I want to stop? Because we've got councils even in the 200s. And then we get to the year 300, and then we arrive at a controversy that maybe not many here are aware of, but we arrive at the controversy where um, Arius, and that reminds me, today we did a show on reason and theology um, with David Hart Bentley, where, I don't know if anybody saw that show, but was, was it my imagination or did it, David Hart Bentley actually say that Arius was a, a traditional Christian. I don't know what on earth. Um, I don't know if I heard that correctly or if perhaps um, I was imagining that I think I heard him say that. Gave me well, you know who was an even more traditional Christian than Arius? Origen. I, mean, I got to tell you, um, I will add one thing for people here. People here, anybody that might have seen the show we did earlier with David Hart Bentley, uh, you might be a bit disturbed if you would have seen it and you would have said, well, how come you guys didn't uh, attack him and debate him? Look, we have on Reason and Theology, we debate, we have interviews, we have roundtables. We can't attack a guest that we're interviewing under their book. So if I've got somebody on and he's talking about his book, I I'm not going to attack him and tell him that I think he's a moron even if I may think he's a moron. Now, do I think David Hart Bentley is a moron? I think he's smart. I think he's terrible when it comes to his theology. Horrific. And today, if you watch the show, you might be horrified at it because it was horrible theology. I asked him um, uh, a number of questions. I, I think, Thomas, you probably heard the show. One of them was if he could tell me if the apostolic fathers believed that everybody would be saved. Let me tell you one thing for people here. I've given a class before on eternal torment. The Bible teaches that hell is eternal. You will roast for an eternity if you willingly reject God, period. There's no way around it. People might think that that doesn't tickle their ears and that, you know, you know, it scares them. At the end of the day, if Origen is your hero, you've got big problems, really, really big problems. But um, let's go back to what we were talking about in the Trinity. Justin Martyr, for in the name of God, the Father and Lord of the universe, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washing with water. He's talking about eternal, he's talking about baptism regeneration, excuse me, here. Now, I'm, I'm not going in depth on any of these fathers, because I've already broken down Justin Martyr with you all. If anybody didn't, wasn't here when I broke down Justin Martyr, uh, I showed you all how Justin Martyr interpreted Daniel chapter 7, which talks about the Son of Man, and he identified Christ as the Son of Man. If anybody didn't catch that, I did that show. You can find it on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. They probably already uploaded it to the YouTube archives. I did a whole show on the Son of Man alone. What is important about Justin Martyr identifying Christ as the Son of Man? It is very important because Justin Martyr then gives that important interpretation in the Greek where the original Greek of the Septuagint of Daniel 7 has serve for Latruo. Why is that important? Because Justin Martyr is teaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man of the Old Testament and that Son of Man is due Latruo, Latrevo, Latria. Latria. What is Latruo? Latruo is worship given to God alone. Anytime you look up the Greek word in the Greek Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, it means worship given to God alone. You don't give Latrevo to Mary. You don't give Latruo to Mary. You don't give Latria to Mary. If you give Latrevo to Mary, you are an idolater. If you give Latruo to Mary, you are an idolater. If you give Latruo to the Holy Trinity, 
you are a very good and wise person. So Justin the martyr talked about giving Latruo to the Son of Man and connected that with Jesus Christ. You use that argument to a Jehovah's Witness or a Muslim and you will bury them. They have no reply. Their only reply is, well, we have some manuscripts that exist today that don't have that Greek word, Latruo, in Daniel 7. So what? They're older. They're not as old as the Byzantine form that, it, that we have. And if you want to bury them, you point, them up, point out how Justin Martyr, look at the year he lived in, the years. He lived in the early, he lived in the 100s. So he's writing in the early era of the church, showing that the most ancient manuscripts would have had Latruo. Now, you might be wondering, how is this important? It is very, very significant. Very. We must know not only how to navigate the Bible, we better be able to navigate the early church, because let me tell you one thing. That is correct, Arthur. He definitely did. And the book of Revelation as well, Arthur. In the book of Revelation, Justin the Martyr interprets Revelation... My memory is horrific. Revelation 3, is that the one where it talks about Christ being the arche, the, arch, the, the, um, the commander of God's army, the, um, uh, yes, well, let me see. I think it is right here, yeah. So let me look for a more modern day translation and I will present to you, I am shocked I remembered where it was, okay. By the grace of God, some miracle. <sighs> Thank you, M M Maria, for sharing that. I appreciate that. So, anybody is, well, before I even break this down for you all, uh, before I even break this down for you all, um, it is important, does anybody... Has anybody heard of the argument used against Christ in Revelation 3.14? This passage is one of the most popular ones used by Jehovah's Witnesses. One of the most popular. Anybody aware of it? Revelation 3.14. I think I've heard it before. You've heard it. I knew you were going to, you had heard it. You cheater. I'm joking. Thomas is very bright. Thomas is very, very bright. I figured he would have heard. Anybody other than Thomas, have you heard? And let me, let me point one other thing out. It is not just Jehovah's Witnesses. Muslims use it as well. I have dialogued with Adnan Rashid, who hopefully I'll be debating soon. I have dial I've debated with Shadid Lewis, who loves using Revelation 3.14. Even though at the end of the day, they're going to argue that it shouldn't, it's not a biblical book, the double standards. Let me break it down for you. Revelation 3.14, they will argue. And the angel, and now y'all might be wondering, why did you go to Revelation? We're talking about the early church fathers. I'll tell you why right now. And the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. So anybody even remotely familiar, and I'm gonna to go to different translations. I'm gonna to go to a number of them. You all will see why. I'm curious what the New American Bible says. Probably something not very good. To the angel of the church, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the source of God's creation. You know what, this is better. This is actually pretty good. This is actually a good translation. I'm shocked. My eyes are going to roll out of my, out, out of my sockets. It's very good. So what Muslims will say and what Jehovah's Witnesses will say is Christ was created. Christ was created. Revelation 3, 14 is proof. If you look at the Bible, if you go to the New Revised Standard Version, Revelation 3, 14 tells you right there the origin of God's creation. Jesus Christ had a beginning. He was created. He was created. 
It doesn't say anything, guys, about the incarnation here. It's talking about the origin of God's creation, meaning he had a point in time when he first came or begin. Look at that right there, beginning. The so footnote is right there. In a Catholic Bible, Jesus Christ had a beginning. How? Now, I see Samantha looking like she hadn't heard of this one before. This is a very powerful one. You better know this one because this is one of the most popular ones. If you hadn't heard it before, you've, you've been hit with a ton of bricks now. It is one of the most popular ones ever brought up. It is more popular than didn't know the time or the hour, or blah, blah, blah. They will use this. And if you run across an intellectual J-dub or Muslim, which is rare, but if you run across an intellectual one, they'll bury you with the Greek. They will tell you it means there, right there, that Jesus Christ had a beginning. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with Revelation 3.14? Somebody give me something here. Somebody that is not Thomas, because Thomas knows the answer. How do you deal with Revelation 3.14? Which tells us that he had a beginning. Can you show the Dewey Rhymes again, the translation? Sure, it's right here. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things say the Amen. The faithful and true witness who is the beginning of the creation of God. He's got a beginning, guys. Come on. Somebody give me an answer. Well, I mean, you can interpret that in different ways. In what way? Give, well, give me, give me the proper way that you could have interpreted it then. Okay, well, for me, at first glance, um, I, it, can, it kind of, to me, it's similar to John, where it says, in the beginning was the wood, and the wood was God, and the wood was with God. Kind of like that. So, how it says... But, but let, 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 me, let me kind of be a, a rude JW and, 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 and interrupt you and tell you that um, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Well, you've got it right there. The word was with God the Father. But this is telling you that he had an origin. So... When was the word with God in the beginning of the creation of the world? Or when was it? But he, he did was he, with did God. he emanate from the mind of God? Because because I'm looking at Revelation 3.14 and I see that he has a beginning. How can you tell me? By the way, I'm just being hard on you. I, I yeah, will tell I know, you yeah, how to, I know. I'll tell you how to unravel it in a bit, but um Well, you guys got to remember the faith, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. Mm -hmm. That for me, that implies it's God's creation originated from this, from. But, the, but remember, um, look at the footnote. The angel, not necessarily that that um, he was the creation. I've had enough. <laughs> So let, let me, let me, does anybody have, um, anybody want to offer, um, does anybody want to, oh, let me see, Arthur. Is, right, yeah, um, but, does, but they, does... they want to hear you exegete this, remember. Okay. Look, Arthur, let me be quite honest with you. With well, the Jehovah's Witness and the Muslim, they don't care about context. They don't care. They don't care that you're, what, you, what they're going to tell you is, stop jumping to another passage or another chapter deal with the one in front of you, and you should be able to. So remember, don't make the mistake of saying, well, um, John 1, 1 is talking about Christ being eternal God. Well, they're going to tell you, I, I want you to deal with this. Don't go to another one. They're going to argue and tell you that was a completely different author. And they're at, at worst or at best, they will tell you, you're, you're misinterpreting the Bible. Or a Muslim will say, look, Look, guy, that shows you how much your Bible has evolved over time. Hannah, Hannah's a cheater. Hannah got it. Hannah is a total cheater. Hannah, I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking with you. That was very good, Hannah. Hannah took long enough. She, she probably knew the answer all along. She was waiting for everybody to, to kind of give their chance, and then she finally just um, ended it. Hannah's 100% right. 1,000%. 
it literally means he is the source. He is the, I like the way Justin Martyr does it. So now, why did I go to Revelation 3.14 <clears throat> when we were talking about Justin Martyr? Well, I did it because Justin Martyr was one of the very first church fathers that exegeted Revelation 3.14. Funny enough, everybody here is probably going to laugh. When I first became friends with Sam, um, maybe about over 10 years ago, when I first became friends with Sam, Sam emailed me because I was debating a Muslim. He emailed me and he gave me some advice. Then we began talking from there. And then Sam asked me for some church father stuff. And I gave it to him. And then he asked me, we began talking about Revelation 3.14. That was our very first conversation. And I told Sam, oh yeah, I've got Justin Martyr who gave an interpretation of that. And Sam's like, there's no way you got somebody that early. I said, oh yeah, I do. I got the Greek lined up perfectly. I sent it to him and we began talking back and forth and we became really good friends ever since then. But the real funny thing is Justin Martyr interpreted Revelation 3.14 and rather than interpreting it like a Jehovah's Witness would or a Muslim would or anybody that was a non-Trinitarian would, he interpreted it by reading the words where you have Arche right here as meaning the commander of God's creation. That just goes to show you, at the very earliest time in church history, nobody was reading it as Jesus Christ being a created being. They were reading it as him being the very source and summit or the commander of all creation. So why did I try to tongue tie you all here? I did it so you can realize that Greek word can be read in another way. But when we read it in the context and we read how the early fathers interpreted it, you've got a home run here. This is really no wiggle room. It is very, very clear. And the early fathers interpreted it. I think I've read about eight of them. Uh, there are probably more. Remember, not a whole lot of early fathers uh, gave uh, an interpretation of Revelation. Funny enough, there's very few that even wrote a commentary in the book of Revelation. Most would only make comments here and there. Oh yeah, Samantha, the early fathers are very, very, very crucial. They're very, very important. I, I emphasize it uh, a ton that the early church fathers are very important. They are crucial. And I make that point that if you know the Bible and the early fathers well, you are unstoppable when dialoguing with Muslims, with Jehovah's Witnesses. It is very important that you know your Bible and your early fathers, but you've got to know your Bible as well. I was very disappointed. Um, I've seen people rely only on the fathers or not want to de delve into the Bible. You've got to know your Bible well. You don't have to be a pro, but know it decent. Get about 10 passages, memorize them. 10 really good ones that are irrefutable. Get them in the back of your pocket, memorize the heck out of them, and you will be unstoppable. Uh, earlier, Sam brought up the, the Book of Wisdom. We'll get there eventually. Um, <clears throat> the Book of Wisdom is crucial. Uh, I think Thomas also mentioned the Book of Wisdom. We've got Wisdom 7, Wisdom 7 and Wisdom 2, which were crucial when the early church fathers were fighting the heresy of Arianism. Now, well, if anybody here doesn't know, excuse me, go ahead. The um, uh, St. Clement of Rome mentions um, wisdom chapter two when yeah. talking about, yeah, which is a prophecy about Christ, interestingly enough. I don't know if, if therein he makes a claim to Christ's divinity, but we see mm. before the year 100 and arguably as early as the 60s, AD, like not these 60s, but the first 60s. <laughs> right. um, but yeah. I'm, I'm totally with you there. You've got, um, by the way, anybody wondering, I will uh, tell you all, we, I am going to be doing a show um, with Gary Machuda in about, um, probably about a week. It will be on his channel where we cover 
the Trinity in the Deuterocanon. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do that before. We will focus on the Holy Trinity only in the Deuterocanonical books. So if you are a Catholic or if you're an Orthodox um, or even an Evangelical wanting to learn more about those books, they were utilized as being part of the Bible from the very beginning. And we are going to do a whole show, probably about two, two and a half hours long, just touching upon those and showing how they were utilized at the earliest controversies of the church. Before I read more of the fathers, does anybody have anything perhaps on, on their mind? I have a question. Um, have sure. you also uh, debated with New Age people? I have debated one New Age individual maybe about eight years ago. I sure have. I've dialogued with a lot of them as well. Do you have it on your page to... Yeah, to if you go to my web, web page, go to the debate um, area. Got a ton of debates there. Just go through there. You'll find it there. And if you can't find it there, email me and I'll get you the link. Okay, thank you. But yeah, I definitely have debated with them as well. I've, I've debated... Um, trying to think of a topic I haven't debated. I know Thomas will probably think of something. He'll try and think of something to stump me. But I've debated almost every topic you can think of under the sun been debating since the dinosaurs roamed the earth but um so if we look at Irenaeus Irenaeus of Lyon an incredible early church father and he was finally given given his due by being being um declared a doctor of the church in reality he's one of the greatest church fathers Saint Irenaeus it's um amazing he was trained by polycarp polycarp was trained by john so we have apostolic succession right there there's much more that can be said about that if anybody loves that then they will love irenaeus i am going through fathers believe it or not that are very misused by jehovah's witnesses they are ripped out of context by them irenaeus of leon the church, though, dispersed throughout the, world, the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples of this faith. Now, why would he remark that? Clearly, because he was taught by Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. John taught Polycarp, Polycarp taught Irenaeus. The church believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and the sea, and all things that are in them, and in one Christ, Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets and dispensations of God, and the advents, and the birth from a virgin, and the passion, and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven, in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his future manifestation from heaven, in the glory of the Father, to gather all things in one. <clears throat> I will remind you all that the great Irenaeus is also one of the earliest fathers to interpret all of those angelomorphic passages as being Christo Christological. Now, what do I mean when I say angelomorphic? That is a, an educated way of saying passages that talk about the angel of the Lord, who is Christ, Irenaeus interpreted them in that way, a number of them. And he viewed the angel of the Lord as the creator of the universe, as God Almighty. Arthur, you're correct. It, it really does look that way. So the rule of faith, which we hold, is that there is one God Almighty who made all things by his word, and fashioned and formed out of that which had no existence, all things which exist. So we've got God the Father, who made all things by his logos, with Christ, by the word of the Lord, with the heavens established, and all the might of them, by the spirit of his mouth. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. There is no exception or deduction stated. But the Father made all things by him, <clears throat> whether visible or invisible. For God needs none of all these things, but is he who, 
by his logos word and pneuma spirit makes and disposes and governs all things and commands that word that you find in revelation 3 14 commands all things into existence he who formed the world for the world is of all he who fashioned it, man he who is the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the god of jacob above whom there is no other god irenaeus was a monotheist being trinitarian means you are a monotheist because we don't believe in three different gods we believe in one God. There is only one God. Therefore, neither would the Lord, nor the Holy Spirit, nor the apostles have ever named as God, definitely and absolutely, him who was not God, unless he were truly God, nor would they have named anyone in his own person Lord, except God the Father ruling over all, and his Son who has received dominion, from his father over all creation. For with him we're always present. I mean, you've got it right here, the Trinity. For with him we're always present, the word, the logos, and wisdom, Safias, the Son and the Spirit, by whom and in whom, freely and spontaneously, he made all things, to whom also, he says, let us make man after our image and likeness. Wow. The Holy Trinity right there. He's talking about the book of Genesis saying that God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit were right there in the beginning. Let us make man after our image and likeness. Against heresies, book four. We move on to Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria was, a, was one of the leaders of the catechetical school of Alexandria. Anybody that has heard talks I've given or debates I've done, I repeat it to the point where you probably already know what I'm talking about. The catechetical school was, it became a literal one after a while. But before it became a literal one, it was a methodological manner of teaching that was originated in St. Mark. So if you Google Catechetical School of Alexandria, it originated with St. Mark and was passed on and on and on until we get, well, we get beyond there, but right now we're at Clement of Alexandria who was nicknamed, if I'm correct, if I'm correct, Adamantius. Was that his nickname? I mean, what an incredible nickname, I think, if that was his nickname. St. Mark? No, Clement of Alexandria. Oh. I think it was his nickname, right? If I'm right, I'm going to just celebrate. I might, I might not. No, I don't think I'm right. It was another, it was another Alexandrian father. Um, Titus, that's I, I still an incredible name. Titus Flavius Clemens. Who was nicknamed Adamantius? I'm trying to remember who it was. Alas, I'm lost on that point, but I'll find it eventually. Anyway, Clement of Alexandria was an amazing early church father, incredible uh, leader of that catechetical school of Alexandria. Um, I love writing and talking about him. O oh, mystic marvel, the universal Father is one, and the one, the universal Word, and the Holy Ghost is one and the same everywhere. Omnipotent. Omniscient, omnipotent, all the omnis that you can think of, you find it in Clement of Alexandria. You even find the doctrine of the Trinity in the heretical Tertullian, unfortunately. It was origin, eh, John? What did I say? I told you guys it was somebody from the Catechetical School of Alexandria. Very cool. John, thank you for that lifeline. I was off by a few years and by a completely different person. <laughs> but a, same school. So anyway, we move over to Tertullian, who was very influential in me becoming Catholic. 
Now you all might be wondering, how was a heretic influential in you becoming Catholic? Well, he, he preserves a lot of apostolic doctrine before he went crazy. He, was incre he is, is an incredible father to read even to this day. Uh, d depends if you want to call him a church father. I don't know what you guys would think. Um, some people will call him a church writer. If we call him a church father, we definitely need to qualify it as he did not die in favor uh, with the church's favor, unfortunately. Arthur, I don't, I do not, uh, Arthur asked me if he, um, yeah, he does, Ariel, no doubt, when he calls the Pope uh, Pontifex Maximus. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think he embraced full-blown modalism, I don't think so. I think that that is a misreading of him, but he, he became a Montanist, which is a pretty bad heresy. He did, he converted to Montanism, that is correct, which is unfortunate. What a brilliant mind to, to eventually convert to Montanism. Yeah, you're thinking of Montanism. It was not modalism. Because Tertullian was definitely a Trinitarian. Uh, was his language a little bit eh, at times? Probably. But at the end of the day, he was Trinitarian either way. He comes before Nicaea. So Tertullian has a lot that he wrote. A ton. Um, I'll, I'll read this one. Yeah. Bear in mind... Always in mind that this is the, the, the true rule of faith, which I profess. By it, I testify that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are inseparable from one another. Inseparable. And so you will know in what sense that is said. Now observe my assertion is that the Father is one and the Son one and the Spirit one and that they are, they're not modes of one another. They are distinct. Now, that, now, as a Trinitarian, you want to use that word, okay? <clears throat> I have made the error before of saying the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are separate. Now, am I correct when I say that? I am, but it can be misinterpreted and really twisted into an unorthodox way. If I were to use that in a debate and I'd be debating against somebody smart, they could ravage me. The better word to use is distinct from one another because they're united in everything they do. Now, when you say separate, you can mean they're separate persons, but they're not separated. But stick to that language. Tertullian knew better. This statement is taken in a wrong way by very uneducated people as well as every perversely disposed person, as, it is, as if it predicted a, a diversity in such a sense as to imply a separation among the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They are not separated. They are united in everything that is done. Everything that is done. Before I move on to... Adamantius, origin. Does anybody have anything on their mind? No. If any of y'all are confused about any of the fathers or have anything on your mind, do not hesitate to ask for clarification. We are now at origin, another heretic. <clears throat> another heretic. Although according to David, uh, David, David Hart Bentley, what a great guy. Hannah, that is an incredible question. So what we've got to do is if a person barely begins reading, reading the early fathers without any kind of guide, they can be in a bit of trouble. But once you get to the ecumenical councils, Hannah, excuse me, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon. Whoa, 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 we don't talk about that one. I knew Thomas was going to, I knew Thomas would love that one. I had to toss Chalcedon in there. Um, for anybody that doesn't know why Thomas said that, do your homework, Oriental Orthodoxy. Do your homework. Um, what I would recommend, <laughs> I love that, Thomas. What I would recommend is we look at what the early father said, Hannah, in totality. 
And if we realize that maybe there is one sticking out that begins to say things that doesn't really jive with the rest of them, we can tell there might be something wrong there. But you know what the guide is? Here's the guide, Hannah. <laughs> if you continue reading the fathers, you will find condemnations of Tertullian in them. You might find one that believes he returned to the faith, but we really don't have any, any evidence of that. The key to knowing whether or not you can trust them is, were they ever condemned? Origen was condemned many times. I don't know what on earth Orthodox scholar David Hart Bentley was talking about today on the show. When he talked about Origen not being condemned, he was condemned, I think, and Thomas might correct me, five times, seven times? I mean, the guy was condemned many times over. Um, well, not to mention the mystics of Eastern Orthodoxy all rip on Origen for yep. being, like, terrible. They do. So you all might be wondering, why are we reading Tertullian or Origen? Because they, they didn't go crazy in the very beginning. They had very good things they said for a period of time. We don't find the kind of condemnation in Origen in Tertullian. You don't find that in guys like Irenaeus, Justin the Martyr, Clement, or any of the other guys. You don't find it there. So that is very important to remember. That is a way you can see whether or not these individuals were orthodox with a tiny O in their mindset. Now, I know some people might be confused. What do you mean by that, William? Well, there's orthodoxy, which is a number of, of um, uh, I don't know, I think like about 300,000 denominations. I'm joking. Orthodoxy, which is a number of, of um, Eastern churches, and then there is orthodoxy with a tiny O. What I mean by orthodoxy with a tiny O, <clears throat> and pay attention because I say it like a million times, is correct method of thinking. Thinking in line with what the church has always taught. So Trinity is orthodox teaching. I don't mean Trinity is orthodox, even though it is, but that is what I mean with by tiny O. Roger, I would, I would definitely not call Tertullian and Origen martyrs of the faith. I'm sure you could probably find some people. I've even found some icons of, um, of Origen, I think, not of Tertullian. I don't think I have. But I would not call them martyrs of the faith. I'm sorry, I just wouldn't do it. So, nevertheless, it seems proper to inquire, what is the reason why he who is regenerated by God and his salvation has to do both with Father and Son and Holy Spirit and does not obtain salvation unless with a cooperation with the entire Trinity? and why it is impossible to become partaker of the Father or the Son without the Holy Spirit. That's incredible. There's so much more in, in origin. And then we get to Dionysius, the Bishop of Alexandria. Who here knows who Dionysius of Alexandria is? Does anybody know? I've heard of him. <clears throat> Dionysus was another, another leader of the catechetical school of Alexandria. He was another figure that was very important to the catechetical school. So, good, good, good figure. In the beginning was the word, the logos, but that was not the word which produced the word. Ooh, very good. For the word was with God, the Lord is Sophia's is wisdom. It was not therefore wisdom that produced wisdom, for I was that, says he, wherein he delighted. Christ is truth, but blessed, says he, is the God of truth. <clears throat> what is he breaking down here? He's breaking down the fact that the Logos is not the Father. The Word, the Son, is not the Father, but was with the Father in the very beginning. 
This is crucial in crushing modalism. Cyprian, Cyprian of Carthage. Finally, when after the resurrection, the apostles are sent by the Lord to the heathens, they are bidden to baptize the Gentiles in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. How then do some say that a Gentile baptized without outside the church, well, this is a controversy. We're not going to go into that right now. Yea, and in opposition to the church, so that it be only in the name of Jesus Christ everywhere and in whatever manner can obtain remission of sin when Christ himself commands the heathen to be baptized in the full and united trinity. <clears throat> We've also got novation, and I will leave you all at Alexander for a reason. Who knows? Who can tell me? Look, I'm going to give you all a prize. I love giving prizes, and I haven't given a prize in a while. I will give you all an audible audio book, really whichever one you want, or if you don't know which one you want, um, I'll pick a really good one for you. If you can tell me why I'm going to close the class today with Alexander of Alexandria, anybody, it even goes to Thomas. Thomas, if you all aren't quick, it's probably going to beat you all. Why am I going to close? And I'm sorry, Hannah's beaten everybody. That was very impressive. That was like within a matter of seconds for somebody that claims to know nothing about church history. Hannah beat everybody. Very good. That is correct, Hannah. You have won in a matter of seconds. What? That is very impressive. Yep. <laughs> um, Alexander was right before the council and a critical figure, a very critical figure leading up to the council. We will hear a ton about him next week, a lot about him. Very, very impressed, impress, impressive there, Hannah. So before we read Novation, and then before we go to Alexander, and I tell you a little bit of the history leading up to Athanasius, and anybody here, you're going to really want to hear about Athanasius and Pope Liberius. Did Pope Liberius sign the Semi-Arian Creed? Who here even knows about that controversy? Who knows about that? Other than Thomas. Thomas, did he sign the creed? Who? I think he signed it under duress or something, but not sure. Did, did Pope Liberius sign the Semi-Arian Creed, Thomas? Uh, yeah, he, um, or, well, it's debated whether or not he signed it. But um, if he did, it was because he was held in captivity. Yeah, he did it under duress. Yeah. Arthur, are you uh, what? What you are Syriac Orthodox? Actually, I am Roman Catholic. My dad's family are Syrian Orthodox. Wow, very good, very very cool, very impressive. So you would be a, you're a Roman Catholic or a Syriac Catholic? I'm a Roman Catholic because my mom's family practiced uh, Roman Catholicism. Because I was raised Catholic, but my parents were married in the Syrian Orthodox Church. Wow. Okay. Liberia signed the Sirmium Sir Creed according to Athanasius and the historian Socrates and Sosimon. <laughs> well, then here, here's the issue there, Ariel. Which creed? Was it the semi-Arian one or was it the full-blown Arian one? Which one did he sign? Wasn't it whatever the emperor had? I don't know what the emperor thought. Well, he didn't, want to, he didn't want to sign that one, so why would he have signed it eventually? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to pick y'all's brain. Um, I'm, I'll eventually get to that. Right. Yeah, I've heard that as well, Ariel. Um, I will, I'm, when we do the class on that issue, uh, I'm going to bring scholar on that will give a good interpretation of that. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I can't tell you all who it is yet, but I'll tell you that it is an expert on, um, on church documents. 
that is a scholar in Greek, Latin, and pretty much everything under the sun. That'll be fun to talk about, but I'm kind of just getting you all really interested in talking about Pope Liberius. That's a very, very fun topic to talk about. Novation. I love that book. He's on the Trinity. And now indeed, concerning the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let it be sufficient to have briefly said this much and to have laid down these points clearly, concisely, without carrying them out in a lengthened argument, for they could be presented more diffusely and continued in a more expanded disputation. Since the complete, the whole of the Old and the New Testament might be adduced in testimony that thus the true faith stands. But because heretics ever struggling against the truth are accustomed to prolong the controversy of pure tradition and Catholic faith being offended against Christ because he is moreover asserted to be God by the scriptures also. And this is believed to be so by us. We must rightly that every heretical calumny may be removed from our faith, contend concerning the fact that Christ is God also in such a way as that it may not militate against the truth of Scripture, nor yet against our faith. How there is declared to be one God, again, the early church was monotheistic. They believed in one true God, but they didn't believe they didn't believe in Unitarianism. Declare to be one God by the scriptures and how it is held and believed by us. That is a great book to read, by, by the way, The Trees of Novation on the Trinity. You could probably find it on New Advent for free. I think you can. Novation, Trinity. I'd recommend anybody read it. Oh, here you go, right here. Great, great book. You've got a whole disputation right here. I definitely recommend anybody, if you have not read it, read it. Before I go to Alexandre, Didache is incredible, Arthur. Oh, yeah, amazing. And, and, and for anybody that may be, may be wondering, I don't know if you were here last week, Arthur, but the past couple of weeks, oh, you weren't. I, reason, wasn't, I wasn't, because it actually clashes with my work time. I'm based in Auckland today. I left early from work, so I was able to catch up. Gotcha. Uh, do you, you do know, are, these... are you on my? Are you on the email list, or are you? Uh, on... No, I don't think so. Okay. I did come here a couple of weeks ago, okay. but yeah, I try to catch it sometimes when I have break from work, but I'm not able to catch the full thing. No do problem. we have a recorded session of it later to help? I them? I do. I need to post the links, and I will be emailing okay. them soon. I've got a ton of Sweet. them. I've got like about twelve that we've done. I will be cool. definitely posting it. Thanks. <laughs> and, and and you might be wondering. I know you posted the did okay there. For people that may be wondering, I've already gone through all of the Apostolic Fathers. I will go through them again later on in the future. I've gone through them, and now I am in the early church anti-Nicene era. Last week, if anybody was here, we went through, what was it, Zechariah and Jeremiah? And I showed you all how the early fathers interpreted the passages in Zechariah and Jeremiah to be prophecies about Christ and the deity of Christ. So before okay. we get to can you, sorry, yeah, no, can you no, make go ahead. PDFs available as well. I sure do. Are you? You are on the email list, right? I don't know. I'm not getting emails. I'm on the WhatsApp group, but I'm not getting your emails. So if you that is really me, that weird. Okay, I I will drop it in the um in the WhatsApp. I don't know why you're not getting the emails. I thought I'd added you. I, I will add you. I got one email and then I didn't get anything since. So. Really? Okay. Yeah. I will make sure to add you tonight. Cool. Thank I, I you. I will definitely add you again and make sure. Uh, I will add you again and make sure you're getting it. I will confirm with you in a, in a, um, I will message you and make sure you get them. Okay. Thanks. Did you get the one on the, um, on the, um, on the exorcist class? No. And I emailed you to please add me to that. Okay. When did you email me today? So, or last night, I think it was today, let me just check. Um, I emailed you at 9.20 a.m. Okay, I will Eastern only warn time. you that, there we go, I've got it. Okay. 
I've got it. I will only warn you, I have gotten um, a ton of emails today, which is good. Um, I say that it's good because a lot of people want to be a part of that. I haven't had the chance to go through them all, but anybody, if you got the email that I sent out, I am doing <clears throat> October 24th for you all only. I am doing a Zoom gathering with Father Lampert, one of the top exorcists in the world. He is coming on with me. I'm going to have him on for about two and a half hours long. I will be talking about a lot of stuff. And I'm going to talk to him for an hour, me and him. And then I'm going to shut up. And whoever is part of the Zoom can talk to him, can engage with him, ask him uh, pretty much anything. If you have already, if you are on the email list and you got the mass email I sent out, I need you to confirm if you want to join because I am going to share it with the people confirming, including the password. Um, if you do want to join, uh, you're more than welcome to. Father Lampert is a good friend of mine. Wh what are we going to be talking about? Number one, we're going to talk about exorcism, his most horrifying things, his good things, horror movies. We're going to talk about Halloween. How can we celebrate Halloween? Um, and then you all can ask them whatever, whatever you want. I am going to put my email here again. If you have already confirmed with me that you want to be in the list, and I know Hannah's confirmed, uh, Samantha, and a, a few other people. I, I haven't looked at all the list. If you've already confirmed, great. That means tonight, late tonight, when I get the chance to go through all my emails, <clears throat> when I finally have time, I will add you to the list for that Zoom gathering. And it will be a ton of fun. It'll be Saturday. Uh, again, I'm only talking with them for an hour because I want to do a special event for you all. I, I know it would be very edifying. Um, and after we talk for about an hour, I'm going to shut up and you all will be able to engage with them um, about really anything on your mind. It'll be a lot of fun. So make sure you email me there to confirm that you do want to be a part of that because the so emails are where I'm adding people to the list. So by confirmation, you just meant to reply and say, yes, I want to be part of the email. That is it, brother. You don't okay. have to say anything else. Just, just reply. Because if you got it and you ignore it, um, I am not being mean. <clears throat> I am only not going to bombard a lot of people that before. I, if I don't get a reply, I have a folder. Because I, I have a folder of people that have confirmed that they do want to go. And I add the names there and I just grab the whole list and I send them the invite with a password. So if you reply, all you got to do is say yes, or just send the number one of you to want to type yes out. And I'll know that you want to be a part of that. Anybody that may be wondering, I had, um, I don't know. I had a few people attend my Marion course I gave on Saturday. I'm giving part two of many of them on Saturday again, which will be probably part two of five on the Immaculate Conception alone, where I am covering the book that I have just published with Father Coppice on Mary. Um, it'll be a ton of fun. Yeah, John is correct. We had Father Lampert on Reason and Theology. After the show, I think I must have gotten over 100 emails from people that wanted to ask him a question, wanted to engage with them, and they couldn't. Uh, so I contacted him. He's a good friend of mine. I said, Father, um, you want to do, you know, a really cool little event with me? And, you know, he was really on board. He said, let us do it. You know, love to do it. So that is something special for me to you all, to show you all that I appreciate you all really loving and wanting to learn about the faith. It's really, really encouraging. But uh, for people that did attend my Marian class I gave on Saturday, I'm going to give another one. I'm covering everything Mariology related, everything. And I am covering um, the book that I published with Father Coppice, by the way. Um, I set the end of the month as the latest date that the book would be out. I'm thinking probably middle of the month now. God willing, you know, it seems to be going faster. Our Audible edition is being worked on. Everything else is being worked on. That should be very soon. And uh, Saturday, this past Saturday, I covered the Immaculate Conception, Genesis 3. We went in depth. I will go even more in depth to Genesis 3 on Saturday, including 
a very in-depth examination of the papal encyclical Ineffabilis Deus. So I will send that link out pretty soon. Hannah, thank you for joining, Hannah. Um, thank you for your, and I will email you so I can uh, talk about that uh, Audible book that you won. Very impressive, Hannah. Very, very good job. So everybody, before I get to Alexander, and Alexander is a very important figure, massively important. Does anybody have anything on their mind? I'm going to wrap it up at Alexander because I know it's a little bit late for some people, but if you have anything on your mind before I get to Alexander. I just got a question. Um, sure. What day is Father going to be coming on here to talk about the exorcism and stuff? Saturday. Saturday at 5 p.m. Central Time. All right, thank you. Yeah, that'll be a ton of fun. So, and um, I know you do want to. I've already marked you down, Thomas. I know you do want to be a part of that. I know Samantha does. I know Hannah. Um, and anybody else that's replied to that email. No, no, October 24th, John. Not, not, not this one. October, the, and I'll write it here. October 24th, 24th. <laughs> Yeah. William, I do have a question. Sure. I, I, um, so just like this talking about these heresies that arose very early. Sure. I was just curious, um, what, like, what was the atmosphere in the 19th century U.S. that allowed for so many heretical Christians, I'm going to call them. Like, why was the why was the U.S. in the 1900s so ripe for it? So, like, you had Mormonisms and Jehovah's Witness and Christian Scientists and Seventh Day Adventists, just to name a few. That was also so ripe for these heresies that seem to have been kind of dormant for centuries. Well. I mean, Arthur is correct. Um, heretical Bible translation is one thing. But another thing that is very prevalent, um, Samantha, is really an abandonment of the ancient faith. And when I say that, an abandonment of the ancient apostolic faith, I mean an abandonment of the heritage of the church, the heritage of the very first church. So the further away we get from the time of Christ, the more heresies seem to pop up. So sola scriptura, you know, isn't the cause in and of itself alone of all these heresies, but it's done a lot of damage. It has done a lot of damage. Now, I don't think a lot of Protestants hold to that the way Luther held to it or the way Calvin held to it, but it has caused a massive rift. It caused it in Germany. Look at what happened in Germany with Lutheranism and then Zwinglianism and what have you. Um, it caused a major rift over there. And then you look at American Protestantism and it's a mess. I mean, if Luther would walk into a, a Baptist church um, today, I mean, if, if Calvin, Luther, <laughs> If Calvin would walk into a Baptist church today, he'd be horrified. He wouldn't recognize anything of his old, the faith that he founded. Or Luther as well. They don't, they don't resemble ancient Protestantism at all. They've moved so far away from it that I call it Americanism. So it doesn't resemble anything of the ancient Protestant faith. But the more and more we move away, the more and more time passes and the more and more we move away from our ancient heritage, it creates a massive mess. Look at, look at what, so if we look at, a little bit off topic, if we look at Martin Luther, Zwingli, John Wesley, Calvin, maybe not Calvin, I don't remember Calvin. We look at John Wesley, we look at Luther, Zwingli, they had high regard for Mary, very high regard. They even talked about Mary being immaculate. Luther believed Mary was immaculate even in his final years. 
So what is the problem? The problem is that once you get to the time of Francis Turretin, you have a total abandonment of any of that. Francis Turretin hated Mary, hated what? Catholicism. Somebody have a question? Yeah, wasn't it Francis Turretin who, who saw, I think, an old lady praying in a church and he, uh, he spoke out against it because he thought it was suspicious, or not suspicious, superstitious? That was Francis Turretin. You're correct. Yeah, How did you remember that? I don't know. I just, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tur Francis Turretin was um, quite, the, quite the Protestant. But Francis Turretin gives um, an argument that I will talk about eventually in my class on Mary once I get to the Reformers, where he tries to deny the Immaculate Conception in almost a stupid way. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's ridiculous. Um, it's just really insane. But it shows you the level that Protestantism has to go as time goes on and they begin to devolve and devolve. And um, Lynn, have a great evening. See you soon. Um, and it really, it's really unfortunate. It really, really is. So I, I always give an example uh, when I talk about orthodoxy. Syriac orthodoxy, um, whichever kind, whatever kind of orthodoxy. When I talk about orthodoxy and I talk about Catholicism, there's an example I always give. You've got, uh, you've got two islands and a, a tiny little stream, a tiny little stream of water down the middle, separating them. Orthodoxy on the left, Catholicism on the right, or whichever way you want to put them. It doesn't really matter which way. Tiny little stream of water in the middle separating them. And then you've got Protestantism on the planet Mars in another way, way out there. Um, anybody that thinks that there'll be unity between Catholicism and Protestantism are not working with a full set of marvels. It just won't happen. Protestantism is in, doesn't resemble ancient Christianity. It just doesn't. Uh, William? Yeah, go ahead, so, brother. But, but I do have a question though about, and I don't know if you maybe you had answered this before, but even within the Catholic Church now, do you have like uh, traditionalists? I don't know a lot about them, but I know that um, they feel very strongly about the church before Vatican II. Sure. Um, after Vatican II, they either they doubt or they just outright don't believe in the legitimacy of Vatican II. Sure. So you do. So number one, you have Sedevacantus who deny the validity of Vatican II. But at the end of the day, we've got our councils. We have the official teaching of the church. We have that enshrined there. The very big difference between that and Protestantism is even if we were to take the radical traditionalists, James, and take their position on the papacy, when we look at everything else, they, would, they agree with everything else, pretty much everything else. When you talk about baptism regeneration with a Protestant, the majority don't believe it. The Eucharist, they don't believe it. Mariology, they don't believe it. Intercession of the saints, they don't believe it. Purgatory, they don't believe it. And that could go on and on and on. And at the end of the day, it resembles nothing. Nothing of ancient Christianity. Um, yeah, Samantha, it is a schism. I mean, it is. They're, they're separated from the church. It is. But... But then again, so are the Orthodox. I hate to be, to be quite honest. Um, they're schismatics. And Thomas would have called them that as well a few months ago, wouldn't you, brother? You bet. They're schismatics. I hate to be honest. I mean, Brother Peter Diamond, right, would probably be applauding me right now. Probably be tapping me in the back and saying, William, I waited for the day for you to say that. But... But the good thing is Thomas didn't record that, right, Thomas? Didn't record what? <laughs> I won't be repeating that. No, let's uh, be honest. They are. They are. I mean, they are. They're schismatics. There's really no other way around it. We have to be honest with each other. I know I joke around, but they are. They're, they're, um, they're way closer to us than anyone else, but they're schismatics. I mean, that's really the way it is. What I think about the ecumenical efforts, uh, I think they're... they're um, they can be good in a certain way, Lucy. 
But, um, yeah, I mean, we agree on a lot of stuff. They can be good if they're, if they're for the better uh, to help certain communities out, and I, I can get on board with that. What I don't agree with are, um, are ecumenical types of gatherings where we're all, we all believe the same thing. Uh, yeah, John's correct. It depends on what's being taught. It really depends on what's being taught. Um, that, that's just really the... Um, Samantha, the, the, they're, they're good. They're good. Uh, we need to have more of them. And um, the Catholics really need to get the Orthodox um, to leave that schismatic state of theirs and return to the true church. Ain't that right, Thomas? Sorry? No, I was saying that the ecumenical efforts are great. They are. They, they, they uh, should be viewed in a different yeah. way. Um, now, I mean, that opens up the door to many other questions, which I'm not going to go into, into the world. Well, the World Day of Prayer, no, I don't. I, don't really, I mean, that's a whole other topic. You're opening up a whole can of worms there. Um, no, yeah, I don't really, I don't like the World Day of Prayer. What's up, Thomas? A whole can of demons. Oh, man, no, that, that's not good. I have to admit, I, my heart was broken by Benedict when Benedict uh, uh, participated in that. Oh, man. That was not good. I don't like the World Day of Prayer, unfortunately. But, I mean, at the end of the day, the Pope is the Pope, and you've got to pray for the Pope. Um, and I do pray for the Pope. I do. So, let's look at Alexander. If anybody has anything else in their mind, please interrupt me. I'm going to go to Alexander, then I'll wrap up the evening. I don't no, forget I, to email. Go ahead, brother. I definitely agree mm -hmm. we should pray for the Pope. I pray for the Pope every time uh, at liturgy. You sure do. That's so Francis or Pope Benedict? <laughs> to watch. Excuse me, James? Pope Francis or Pope Benedict? What about him? No, I'm just wondering. Some, you say you pray for the Pope, so I don't know if, like, if it's... Well, I pay for, pray Pope. for them both. The, the Pope and the Pope Emeritus. I pray for them both. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to avoid praying for Francis. I mean, why would I? I'm not going to avoid that. I'm Catholic. I'm not a set of the context. Therefore, mm -hmm. the holy prophets and all, as I have said, who righteously and justly walked in the law of the Lord, together with the entire people, celebrated a typical and shadowy Passover, the creator and Lord of every visible and invisible creature, the only begotten Son, and the Word co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit and of the same substance with them, according to his divine nature, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. That's very important language. You can tell how the language has evolved. Why has it evolved? Because there are heretical people that are challenging the teaching of the church. We need to read things like only begotten, co-eternal, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and of the same substance with them. By the way, it is my assertion and my argument that we need to believe in the doctrine of the filioque for the full glory of the sun to be center, central. And I will prove that, just not tonight. Therefore, to the unbegotten Father, indeed, we ought to preserve his proper dignity in confessing that no one is the cause of his being, but to the Son must be allotted his fitting honor in assigning to him, as we have said, a generation from the Father without beginning and allotting adoration to him, worship, so as only piously and properly to use the words he was, and always, and before all worlds with respect to him, by no means rejecting his Godhead, but ascribing to him a similitude, which exactly answers in every respect to the image and exemplar of the Father. But we must say that to the Father alone, belongs the property of being unbegotten, of course. For the Savior himself said, my father is greater than I. And besides the pious opinion concerning the father and the son, 
we confess to one Holy Spirit as the divine scriptures teach us, who has inaugurated both the holy men of the Old Testament and the divine teachers of that which is called the new. The language is very nuanced. It's very, very careful. It is correct. The Father alone is unbegotten. Now, how, why does the Savior say, my Father is greater than I? Clearly, in terms of his human nature, the Father wasn't begotten. He was, in that sense, because the Son notes that he will be returning to glory. The, the very context, the very context of that is Trinitarian. So if a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness try to use that against you, bury them, they wouldn't be smart at all. Because he's talking about the Father being greater in the sense of the Father being in glory. And he will be returning to glory where the Father is and where he was from the beginning of time. It's not a very good passage. And I think Muslims and uh, J-dubs are catching on to the fact that people know how to defend themselves against that and they will just completely bury them now. By the way, the Father is unanimous on that passage. And that interpretation. So it's, it's not a good interpretation. But Alexander <clears throat> was the very first man to ring the alarm on the heresy of Arianism. And it eventually would catch the ear of the great and the fiery Saint Athanasius. It would eventually lead to the great council of Nicaea. One of the greatest ecumenical, well, the first ecumenical council ever, and one of the greatest. And we will examine that. And when we get to that, because we'll get to that before we get to the filioque, then we will unpack the filioque. We'll go back to the Bible, look at what the filioque is. We will look at the, whether or not, well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if anybody knows the doctrine of the filioque, it is essential to Trinitarian language. At the end of the day, if it is biblical, and it is, if it is part of the divine tradition of the church, you should want to know it. And I promise you, I will unpack it for you all, for you all to recognize it biblically and in a historical fashion. And I probably won't deal with it till another two weeks. Next week, we will go to Nicaea. We'll look at the controversy there. But then after that, we will get to the filioque and to the loaded language. My goal is to break down that loaded language. People hear filioque and they're like, what are you talking about? You know, I don't know what you're talking about. We'll break down that loaded language. Because if you ever dialogue with an Orthodox individual, um, some of them deny the filioque. And if you don't know what they're talking about, well, it won't go well for you, let me just say that. It, it, you should know it. That is an area where, uh, I don't know what faith, faith everybody is here, but if we have Catholics, that's an area where Orthodox have got a stronger grasp on the issues. You don't, you, if you go to Amazon, look for a book in the Filioque written by a Catholic. Good luck. Good luck with that. Good luck finding a good one. You probably find a little pamphlet, 20 pages long. Um, you know, you, you'll have a trouble finding a good one. Um, but you'll find a lot of good ones written by Orthodox scholars. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, there are not any really good ones written in modern day language in English. So it's an area that Catholics need to be prepared to defend their faith on. And I know, I think Thomas, Thomas, you still hold to the filioque, don't you? Yeah, I would hold to it in the sense that Florence uh, defined it, that it is from the Father through the Son in that sense, and that therefore the monarchy of the Father is preserved while the, um, while the hypostasis of the Spirit is distinguished from the Son by that procession. Okay, so you would agree then that the book of Revelation is not merely taught. Well, let me break it down for people that may be a little confused. I would the say it's on a both, both uh, 
oikonomia and um, ontological procession. Okay, so not merely reduced to economia. Correct. I would say it's the whole thing. I, okay. I think it makes sense to say that the that economia, um, yeah. you know. Well, uh, not 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 you you, you 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 wouldn't interpret it as being um, a temporal yeah. ver- vision in heaven. Correct. I w- I would say that that economia reflects what the ontological procession looks like. Um, great. And I believe that the fathers interpreted that way. For people that may be wondering and saying, what on earth are you guys talking about? We promise you we will break that down uh, in a couple of weeks. I will break that down in a couple of weeks if Thomas is here. Um, he can throw a tomato at me if he agrees or he doesn't. But it sounds like we're on the same page. For everybody here that may be wondering, that passage in the book of Revelation is one of the most important Trinitarian passages in the whole Bible. It is a crucial one that everybody has got to understand. And I promise you, I will break it down for everybody. I am going to wrap it up already, but I will, I will um, if anybody has anything on your mind before I do leave, um, you know, hey, feel free to ask me whatever you may have on your mind. Lucy, thank you for, for coming. Great having you here. If y'all have anything on your mind, please do not be shy. Um, um, so first one way I'm, do you know any scholar who's like an expert on private revelations and how poor they're interpreted, especially like in modern times? Because I know it's getting pretty popular with the current pandemic. And I don't know if you've heard, but there are some like YouTube people who are, they're, they're Orthodox Catholics, but they're, they're using private, private revelation to try to maybe interpret what we're going through now as signs of maybe a, a transition into some sort of new era. Or something like that. So, do you know any scholars who are, who are familiar with private revelations and how you discern private revelations? Like, whenever you hear somebody making a claim or you you see it on on the internet, is there anybody who can tell? Okay, what's the process by how you discern whether or not a private revelation might be authentic? Because you know, it takes a long time for the church to actually make a judgment, and most of the times, it's usually either there's no judgment or it's condemned at first, and then change the wrong and then they accept it. So, but before that process, is there a method to discern, you know, whether you think it might be authentic or not? I, I, I know one individual, um, I could try and get you in touch with them if you email me a reminder. Um, and that individual will probably tell you the same thing that I would say, that um, if it doesn't line up with, um, with what we have revealed to us in Holy Writ, and in the early fathers, if it, if it goes against anything dogmatic, avoid it. If it doesn't, then it's really merely a theological opinion. Um, I've heard a number of them. People say, well, look at the book of Revelation. Uh, this is what is happening now. This is what we're going through. Um, I mean, that's their own personal uh, opinion. I mean... Hmm. If we look at, if I have got people that have said, well, look at the revelations of this saint. I clearly believe they're, they're, they're talking about what we're going through right now. But then you look at them and they really don't line up. I mean, we've lived through way worse times before. The church has. I mean, anybody familiar with what was going on during the Florentine Council would realize that this is cake compared to what we went through back then. Literally cake, nothing compared to what and we went through. does that also include uh, any... Does that also include any um, reforms made after the Second Vatican Council? Flor- Florence was well, well, way before Vatican II. No, I mean, let's say you have private revelations that, that claim to say, oh, you know, the things that were done in the Second Vatican Council weren't true or they were wrong or, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, I guess we can... Um, it's, I guess it might be obvious then. Well, I, I mean, I've, 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 I've heard a ton of people that tried to connect the reforms that had happened after Vatican II with um, prophecies. Now, are some of them maybe true? They could be. Uh, They could be. I'm not on board with a lot of the reforms that have occurred, unfortunately. But, um, I mean, I don't think it... I think the one area that we need to realize, and it's a very important thing, I don't think it nullifies the fact that the church is still the true church. Um, I think that's the most important thing I would point out. 
Okay. But if you do want to, um, I do know um, somebody that does specialize in private revelations. Get in touch with me. I'll get you in touch with Okay. Them. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else have anything on their mind? I hate not... to ask, but could you, could you re repeat your answer on Revelation 314? Because when you answered that, my computer, uh, my computer froze and I had to restart and I missed your answer. Sure. Let me briefly, um, I'll briefly summarize it for you all, because I know some people have to go. <laughs> Revelation 314 is very important in that when we look at Revelation 314, um, right here, Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims will claim that it is talking about Jesus Christ having an origin in the sense of he was created. They will make that argument that he was created. But when we look at the Greek, the Greek doesn't necessitate a creation. It could mean commander, source, or it could mean a number of different things. Then when we look at what the earliest fathers say, Justin Martyr being one, they interpreted Revelation 3.14 with the exact Greek breakdown as referring to the fact that Christ was not a created being, but was the commander of God's creation. Does that help? Absolutely. Thank you very much. No problem. Everybody, I will, um, I will wrap it up. If anybody does have any last thing on their mind, um, let me know. Then everybody, I will wrap it up. And I look forward to seeing you all, hopefully God willing, next week. If you want to attend my Mariology class on Saturday, I will send that invite out. I think you'll all be very edified with it. It'll be a ton of fun. We're going to get a look into the book that I've just written with Father Coppes. Um, if you're wondering what book, it is uh, that book right there. Um, I'm going to be covering one of the chapters. We're going to be going very in-depth on it. Before the book comes out, we're going to be going in-depth, uh, giving you all the... Um, and Mariology, I'm going to cover everything in, in, in the teaching of every dogma of Mary, every single one. I will leave nothing, uh, nothing un uncovered. Everybody have a great evening and God bless you all. You all take care.